Honourable Members, the President. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society. Bless this Legislative Council now assembled to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory, the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this State. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This house acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people, and pays its respects to their elders, both past and present. Members, I just have a statement I'd like to make in relation to the election of the Senator today, uh, Mr Benjamin Small. Um, I've got the honour to inform you that at a joint sitting of the Houses of Parliament of the State of Western Australia held in Perth on the 25th of November 2020, the members of such houses sitting and voting together in pursuant of Section 15 of the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act did choose Benjamin John Small of 294 Mackey Street, Victoria Park, Western Australia, to hold the position vacated by former Senator the Honourable Matthias Cormann. Members, are there any statements? Uh, sorry, are there any petitions? The Honourable Alison Zamon. Uh, President, I present a petition containing 2,929 signatures couched in the following terms. Uh, to the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia and Parliament assembled, we, the undersigned, are opposed to the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage acceding to any request from the City of Joondalup, enabling it to acquire any Crown land for commercial purposes or for housing under acquisitions in the Percy Doyle Reserve. Percy Doyle Reserve contains the largest active sporting park in the city of Joondalup. It has seven permanent user and community groups, Greenwood Football Club, Marmion Cricket Club, Marmion Sorrento Duncraig Progress and Ratepays Association, Sorrento Duncraig Junior Football Club, Sorrento Football Club, Wanneroo Joondalup T-Ball Club and the, and the Wednesday so Social Soccer Group. Presently, various state management orders designate this site for civic, cultural, parks and recreation use only. The northern part of the site hosts a very successful library with an associated recognised biodiverse natural areas reserve which feeds carnaby cockatoos and other associated fauna. The only community permaculture edible garden on Crown land in the city of Gingerlup operates in close association with the library and is a delight to residents. The Percy Doyle Reserve is absolutely integral to community wellbeing in the the city of Joondalup and in the broader regional areas and currently supports around 40 community and sporting clubs and groups. Any commercial housing change to any part of this park affects the whole park usage. We therefore ask the Legislative Council to support our petition and maintain the Percy Doyle Reserve as Crown land and to its present regional park designation as one of the foremost sporting, cultural, civic and recreational spaces in the city of Gendalup. And your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. The Honourable Alison Zamon. Madam President, I present a petition containing 950 signatures couched in the following terms. To the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia and Parliament are assembled. We, the undersigned, are supportive of the progress of Carnup train station. The State Government, specifically the Minister for Transport and Planning, Honourable Rita Safiotti, has delayed this train station for three years despite it being a promise at the 2017 state election. We call on the Minister and the State Government to complete the business case and start construction immediately. We therefore ask the Legislative Council to support the immediate construction of the Carnup train station. And your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. Are there any further petitions? The Honourable Diane Evers. President. To the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in the Parliament assembled. 
We, the undersigned, are opposed to important state-owned tier three rail infrastructure being closed by the lessee, thus transferring costs to W export industry taxpayers and ratepayers and impacting upon road safety and the environment. Do I take a breath? We support the reopening of tier three rail lines and ask that the Legislative Council recommend the state government, one, make a pre-election commitment to the upgrade and reopening of tier three rail lines, two, ensures transparency in all future contracts relating to rail line access so that less powerful users are not disadvantaged, and explores options to return the control of tier three lines to the state when the lessee declares them to be uneconomic and your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. And sorry, I did forget to say that this petition contains 38 signatures and couched in those terms. Thank you. Are there any further petitions? Are there any statements by ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Are there any papers for tabling, Leader of the House? Following papers to be laid on the table, reports ministerial office staffing as at 29 October 2020, Report on consultants engaged by government for the six months ended 30th of June 2020. Are there any further papers for tabling? Okay. Parliamentary Secretary to the Deputy Premier. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I have the following annual reports for tabling. The Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, 2019-20. Uh, National Health Practitioner Ombudsman, 2019-20. The Honourable Adele Farina. Um, thank you, Madam President. I am directed to present report number 35 of the Standing Committee on Public Administration, Government Response to Report 31, Coming Home Safely, Work Safe and the Workplace Culture in Western Australia. That report's tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Uh, yes, Madam President. Um, the report I have just tabled advises the House that on the 18th of August 2020, the Standing Committee on Public Administration tabled its legislative, in the Legislative Council its Report 31, Coming Home Safely, Work Safe and the Workplace Culture in Western Australia. The Government's response was tabled in the Legislative Council on the 20th of October 2020. The committee regards the government's responses to a number of recommendations contained in the report as disingenuous. They are disrespectful to the House. They are, in some cases, offensive to the witnesses who gave of their time to provide evidence to the committee, particularly bereaved family members. Moreover, they are disrespectful to the role of parliamentary committees in carrying out inquiries and making recommendations for action by government. Committees provide an opportunity for organisations and individuals to participate in policy making and to have their views placed on the public record and considered as part of the decision making process. Those views are recorded in committee reports and in this instance many of them have been disregarded by the government. The committee is concerned that this failure to address recommendations made out to a department could set an unhelpful precedent for government responses going forward. This could potentially undermine the value of parliamentary committee work in, in the future. The committee is also of the view that the government response fails to meet the requirements of Standing Order 191 and therefore resolved on the 4th of November 2020 to bring this to the attention of the Legislative Council. I commend the report to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Hon. Sally Talbot. President, I'm directed to present report number 48 of the Standing Committee on Legislation, uh, Guardianship and Administration Amendment Medical Research Bill 2020, and amendments made by the Guardianship and Administration Amendment Medical Research Act 2020. That report's table. Would you like to make a statement? Yes, Madam President, I would. Thank you. Madam President, the report I've just tabled advises the House of the Committee's findings and recommendations following its inquiry into the Guardian Administration Amendment Medical Research Bill 2020 and the resulting Act, the Guardianship and Administration Amendment Medical Research Act 2020. Medical research involving incapacitated people was previously conducted in Western Australia based on laws governing medical treatment. However, this practice was discontinued in 2018 after the Department of Health issued guidance to health service providers in Western Australia advising them against performing medical research in this way. 
The discontinuance of medical research involving incapacitated people has negatively affected the treatment of patients with conditions such as dementia, traumatic brain injury and cardiac arrest. It has also created a barrier to, treating it, to developing treatments for new illnesses. The Bill and the resulting Act have introduced a comprehensive framework of laws to enable medical research involving incapacitated patients to resume in Western Australia. The committee is of the view that the new laws introduce important safeguards that will protect incapacitated research candidates involved in medical research. The Department of Health advised the committee in October 2020 that nobody has actually been enrolled in medical research since the introduction of the bill and the resulting act. However, the committee is of the view that there are currently no legislative barriers to recommencing medical research involving incapacitated people in Western Australia. The committee has made three recommendations to improve the new laws. These are, one, to amend the definition of independent medical practitioner to alleviate confusion among health service providers about who can perform this role. Two, to amend the definition of lead researcher to allow nurses, psychiatrists, paramedics and other allied health professionals to be a lead researcher. And three, to repeal the four-year sunset clause that will delete the provision allowing medical research involving incapacitated research candidates in urgent circumstances. I commend the report to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling? Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? Are there any motions without notice? Uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Madam President. Madam President, I have a matter of privilege understanding, Order 93, of your consideration. Uh, and the yep. matter of privilege is in relation to the uh, order of this chamber, uh, which was made on the March the 4th, for the government to table a series of documents in relation to uh, medical advice received in relation to COVID-19. Um, and um, the government response to that order. Now, Madam President, I'll just take you through a few things with regard to the issue that I have uh, for your consideration. Madam President, uh, I moved a motion on November the 4th for the government to table a, a number of documents. Now, I did so um, under enormous amount, after an enormous amount of consideration, given the usual processes for, that, for gaining that information had elicited no response from the government. The FOI process questions in Parliament. So the only process that was left open to me, Madam President, was to do something very unusual, and that was to order the government to, to um, provide that information. Now, the wording of that motion, Madam President, were as follows. That the Honourable Sue Ellery, Leader of the Government and the Legislative Council, be ordered, and is hereby so ordered, to lay on the table of the House not later than seven days from the day on which this order is made, on behalf of the Government of Western Australia, the information and documents described below, and that such documents be tabled without excision, alteration or defacement. Copies of all communications between the 13th of uh, October 2020 and the 20th of October 2020, inclusive, not including, but limited to letters, emails, telephone notes, text messages and file notes, received by any of the following relating to advice or information on COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. One, the Premier, the Honourable Martin McGowan, MLA. Two, any staff member of the Office of the Premier, including contract, temporary or seconded staff. Three, the Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, MLA. Four, any staff member of the Office of the Minister for Health, including contract, temporary or seconded staff. Five, the Chief Health Officer, Dr Andrew Robertson, and six, any member of the any staff member of the office of the chief health officer, including contract, temporary, or seconded staff. Now, Madam President, that was a very specific guideline for that order. Quite specific. This House agreed with that motion. It was 19 to 11, 19 vote to 11, but that's irrelevant. The House accepted that order. So the government was then, therefore, compelled or ordered to provide that information as directed by the Legislative Council. Now. Madam President, on the, uh, Wednesday the 11th of November, the Leader of the House provided the government response within the seven days stipulated. So I was, I was very happy that they did do that. However, I was, the response of the government, dare I say it, was extremely underwhelming. And in fact, I see it as a slight to this chamber 
and uh, really it shows contempt for the government in behalf of um, the order that was provided to the government. Now, in essence, I'll read part of the response that was provided by the government, Madam President. It states, in part, these documents include all the advice received from the Chief Health Officer and his staff within the date stipulated, with, uh, with the exception of Cabinet and confidence documents, duplications and documents prepared for National Cabinet. I can accept that, Madam President. But what was, what was actually tabled were 16 emails, Madam President, 16 emails purely to and from um, the, Chief Health Officer's, um, the Chief Health Officer and his office. A lot of it had nothing to do with COVID, I've got to say. Some of it had to do with estimates, operations, etc. But it seems like it's a lot of uh, information that's provided, but it's not. It's 16 emails. And that's only from one particular aspect, and that is from the Chief Health Officer. Now, can I say, Madam President, that that in itself does not mean that the government did not comply with the order that was provided. Right? The, the response from the government completely and absolutely excluded any of the other information, for example, um, letters, telephone notes, text messages, file notes, etc., from the Chief Health Officer. It also fa completely fails to provide any information whatsoever from the Premier, the Honourable Martin McGowan, MLA, any staff member of the Office of the Premier, including contract, temporary or seconded staff, the Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, MLA, any staff member of the Office of the Minister for Health, including contract, te uh, temporary or seconded staff. So in effect, Madam President, at very best, the, the response from the government only dealt with two of the six areas of stipulation with that order. Two of the six. And that even the two that were covered weren't covered adequately at all. So that's one area. Um, the other area I'd like to bring up with the government response, Madam President, is the point in where the, uh, uh, the, response, the uh, statement state says, the primary focus was on the state borders, sorry, the second point I would like to uh, I would make is that in compiling this information, we read carefully the contributions made in debate on the motion. Mindful of the fact that it would uh, not be humanly possible to find and table everything, we have looked specifically at what was canvassed in the debate. The primary focus was on the state borders and the advice provided by the Chief Health Officer, and whether or not this advice was compromised by a in inverted commas, smoking gun that was referred to. Now, Madam President, the smoking gun comment came from the Leader of the House. It, it did not come from myself. It came from the Leader of the House. I repeated the, the comment from the Leader of the House. I repeated it. So what I'm saying is they were using the smoking gun element as a justification for trying to, to for what, uh, what information they would provide. That, is, that completely and absolutely uh, makes a mockery out of the intent of the motion and then the, uh, the order, Madam President. The motion was quite specific in terms of what was required. It was quite specific. The documentation is quite specific in terms of what was required. The people that were involved were quite specifically identified in terms of what was required and was ordered by this chamber. Now, it was compounded recently, Madam President, on the 17th of November during the uh, uh, budget estimates hearings, where we did have actually the Chief Health Officer uh, appear. And the Chief Health Officer um, was questioned by the Honourable Nick, Nick Graham. And I'll read in part that, that issue, Madam President. The Honourable Nick Graham stated, this is on uh, uh, Department of Health um, Estimates and Financial Operations from Tuesday the 17th of November 2020. The Honourable Nick Graham. Parliamentary Secretary, I think that the Chief Health Officer knows what he has been asked and what he has not been asked. I'm just clarifying the evidence that he, he has just provided to the committee. I understood he, uh, him to indicate that he has provided documentation, being emails, that has been received by his office during the period the 13th of October to the 20th of October. That is not in dispute. The question I have is, has he been asked to provide communications, correspondence, emails that he provided to the Premier's office during that period of time? Dr Robertson, as far as I'm aware, the request uh, was for information that I had received from the Premier. And, and, and other parties, not for information I may have, been, uh, have provided to those parties. So the, the Chief Health Officer, Madam President, wasn't even asked for any information he provided to those other two sources. That came from the Chief Health Officer. Right? Then the, the Honourable Nick Garand states, uh, asked, 
Chief Health Officer, is it normally your ordinary custom and practice to keep notes of conversations that you have had with the Premier of Western Australia? Dr Robertson. Through the Parliamentary Secretary, I generally keep notes of all conversations that I have. The Honourable Nick Garan. Are they kept in the form of a diary or some other manifest? Dr Robertson. They are generally kept in the form of a diary. The Honourable Nick Garan. And you have not been asked by the government to provide copies of those diary notes? Dr Robertson. No, I have not. So, Madam President, my issue here is quite clear. We are very conscious of the necessity for confidentiality, very conscious, and particularly in this, uh, the period of the pandemic, we are very conscious of the fact that we do not want to in any way create fear in the community. We did not in any shape or form, and I most definitely not any shape or form, cast an aspersion against Dr Robertson with regard to that motion. The whole point of the exercise from my perspective, and it was endorsed by this chamber, was to provide some transparency in terms of the information that was provided to the people of Western Australia. That's all that was asking, we were asking, Madam President. And in fact, in a conciliatory fashion, we removed a significant component of the scope of the original motion, Madam President, by taking out the departments, the uh, Department of Health and the Department of Premier and Cabinet. So, Madam President, um, in essence, my issue that I'm asking you to consider as what I would regard as a matter of privilege is whether or not the government has complied to the order. The order that was provided and agreed to by this chamber is quite specific. It is unambiguous. It is transparent. The response that was provided by the government has ignored at least three quarters of that order. It has shown contempt for the order that was provided by this chamber. And I think we deserve better than that. And that is why, Madam President, I ask for your consideration of this issue as a matter of privilege. Leader of the Opposition, I've listened to what you've had to say um, and I'm not going to make a ruling right now. I'm going to go and review all of the documents and the Hansard and I will defer the matter and provide a ruling at a later stage. So, members, with that, we now move on to committee reports. Uh, the Honourable Matt Swinburne. Uh, Madam President, oh, I think you need to... Um on committee reports. Yes, somebody else needs to jump oh, in the okay. chair. We're going to deal with committee oh, reports. Yes, all right. But I Wait. applaud your enthusiasm. Oh, I'm enthusiastic, so thank you. <laughs> I'm just excited to speak on my report. <clears throat> Do you want that? Order. Members, uh, we now come to consideration of committee reports uh, in committee. Uh, we've only got 26 of them, and this is probably our last occasion to consider them in this parliament, so we'd better get cracking. The first is uh, report number 52 of the Standing Committee on Environment and Public Affairs. Uh, the continuation uh, of debate on the motion that the report be noted. The uh, Honourable Elders, do you wish to continue your remarks? Thank you. 
The Honourable Chair. Matt Swinbourne is very early uh, out of the race. The thank, you, Chair. thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. It gives me uh, pleasure to speak on this report, as I was the chair of the committee uh, that tabled uh, uh, and did the inquiry into this report. The uh, punitive, uh, punitive not protective when the mandatory registration of young people is not based on risk. And I um, uh, have been looking forward to this opportunity to get a chance to uh, speak about it in committee reports uh, because I think uh, the work that we did on this uh, report was uh, quite important and I think it is one of those areas where uh, without the committee system of the Legislative Council it might not be an issue that was uh, ever ventilated uh, and had an opportunity for um, this kind of work to be done. So uh, I think I also broke with tradition when I uh, included a chair's forward uh, in the report which is not the usual practice in the Legislative Council, but uh, in this instance I felt as the chair, and I think I was supported by my fellow committee members, that it was important to give that kind of summary at the beginning of the report, which of course reflects um, uh, my views about many of the matters that we investigated. Uh, but before I plough into the detail of the report, I'd of course like to thank the um, assist uh, or, or give acknowledgement and thanks to the assistance that we received uh, during the course of our inquiry from our uh, very capable uh, and dedicated committee staff. Mr Alex Hickman, uh, Ms Amanda Gillingham, Ms Madison Evans and Ms Christina Crichton. They were uh, very ably assisted uh, during the course of this inquiry. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow uh, committee members as well, the Deputy uh, Chair of the Committee, the Honourable Colin Holt, uh, the Honourable Samantha Rowe, the Honourable Tim Clifford and the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas. And it, uh, it pleased me that we were able to reach a consensus position on this report and that um, it reflects the views uh, of each member of the committee. Um, and so that uh, is always a good outcome, I think, when we're dealing with uh, these sort of issues. So the, the, this uh, uh, report uh, arose out of a petition that we received, uh, petition number 70. And petition number 70, I believe, only had one signature on it. Uh, and many members have tabled petitions here with many, many signatures on it. Um, but it is not the requirement of the, uh, educa uh, the Environment and Public Affairs Committee to necessarily conduct more detailed inquiries into petitions just because they have many, many um, signatures on them. Um, in many cases, uh, the issues that are put forward uh, when you've got 15,000 signatures are extremely well ventilated already. And so uh, it, it's quite um, useful and important, I think, that that committee uh, is able to uh, make its own decisions as to which matters it inquires more into more detail through a proper formalised process, uh, regardless of the number of signatures that are involved. In other parliaments, sometimes the signatures, uh, there's a threshold requirement, but I don't think that's something that should ever be adopted uh, in our chamber. So it, the petition number 70 had uh, a very few uh, signatures, as I recall only one. Um, but the subject matter of the petition uh, was such that um, it obviously compelled the committee to take uh, um, further action to inquire into it. Uh, and from my own point of view, I think that had something to do with the fact that uh, it was unlikely that this um, sort of thing uh, would ever uh, be looked into, which is essentially the inclusion of young people on the sex offenders register. Uh, and so uh, uh, young people are um, typically um, uh, disenfranchised from the political and legislative process anyway by their youth and the people that are put on the sex offender register when they're a young person are probably, um, uh, not probably, are most definitely even more so uh, disenfranchised from, from that process. Uh, but there are some people in the community that do stand up for them uh, and do uh, advocate for them. I think the Honourable Martin Pritchard might have been the tabling member in this particular instance as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not our job to always be uh, giving voice to those that have um, got the most popular issues. We do sometimes have to look into the dark corners uh, of this sort of area. And so really the mischief of the petition was the, um, how, um, uh, the, since the creation of the Sex Offenders Register back in 2004, uh, the, the, in, it has included uh, a very broad range of offenders and it's got the most serious kind of offenders on it, uh, those that absolutely should be uh, monitored, um, but it also includes people who make uh, mistakes uh, when they're young uh, and very young uh, are also included on that register. And the register, when it was created, was described um, uh, as not being a form of punishment. 
um, and that, in fact, it's an administrative um, action, not a punitive action. It's not part of uh, the sentencing um, in relation to uh, 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 when someone's found guilty of a, 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 an offence. Um, you know, the, the, the penalty there could be community service, it could be jail time, it could be any number of other um, uh, uh, punitive uh, practices uh, that are, are used. But the actual inclusion on the register is not a part of the punishment. It's there to protect the community from recidivist uh, sexual offenders, particularly those um, that commit offences against children. Um, but of course, uh, in its uh, development or in its design, it caught those children that commit sexual offences against other children. And so, uh, and again, those can be um, uh, relatively innocent in a non-legal sense. They can be um, um, very heinous. And what the committee didn't look at, we didn't look at um, whether or not uh, penalties or offences in this area are appropriate. What we were looking about is whether or not um, it should be mandatory that people are put on the sex offender register um, following uh, uh, their finding of guilt or, uh, or admission of guilt uh, uh, through this process. And whether or not it was appropriate for uh, the, the, particularly the President of the Children's Court to have a discretion as to whether or not a person goes on a register or not. Um, because presently, um, uh, putting, uh, 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 mandatorily putting people on the register results in all people putting on, regardless of their continuing risk to the community. And the register, the purpose of the register, of course, is to protect the community against recidivist uh, uh, sexual offenders. Uh, and, and, and as I say, that's quite appropriate for that to exist um, for a class of people who do pose a identifiable risk to the community. Uh, what the committee's finding is, is that there's no justification for including on there people who have committed offences um, who pose no continuing risk for the community. In fact, um, we face the prospect of including all people mandatorily who commit these offences, regardless of age, and the criminal culpability in this state starts at 10, so you can have children as young as 10 being put on the sex offender register and having the necessary reporting requirements and uh, uh, the police follow-up that they have on the register. Um, uh, the risk that you have is that you put so many people on there, and I think there's almost, uh, we're getting close to 4,000 people on this register, that the police um, uh, don't have the time and resources to monitor it as thoroughly as that they, they should or that they can in relation to those that genuinely need to be um, uh, on the register, genuinely need to have reporting requirements, genuinely need to be looked at, at by the police on a continuing basis because of the continuing risk that they serve to our community and our children. So that's really the risk that we have of having a register with no discretion. Uh, and I think most of us would be alarmed to think that the police would be so overwhelmed because of the sheer numbers on the register that they couldn't perform the job of actually protecting the community by looking at the people who need to be on the register. So uh, uh, the, some of those recommendations, and I think the key recommendation is the introduction of a discretion into the uh, justice system so that uh, the, the president of the Children's Court, when dealing with an offence um, that comes within the, the amber of the uh, register, has the discretion to decide whether or not um, uh, that child is put on that register or that young person. Uh, one of the vexed issues we had to deal with um, through the course of the inquiry is what is a young person, because we're, we're not here strictly speaking about a, a child, um, which is a, you know, legally a person under the age of 18. Uh, there's no universal definition of a young person, and there's a recognition amongst particularly um, psychologists and psychiatrists and other developmental people that not everybody matures at the same age, and that 18 is a is an arbitrary uh, point in time uh, and it doesn't give um, uh, uh, enough credence to the overall circumstances that exist uh, in a particular case of offending. And so um, the committee, I believe, uh, came to a conclusion that a young person should be a person who is, uh, oh, I'm going to probably get it wrong, but is, is, is 20 or below years in age. And I think there was a range of reasons, I think, that we came to that particular conclusion. And I think that's recognition of the fact that, um, you know, there is a mix of people through our education institutions, our training institutions of different ages um, that mix together. And we have to remember um, that under our um, secondary education system, that 18-year-olds are now part of that system um, because 
uh, and they will have contact with people within their own year group who are not legally adults. They're legally adults if they are born in the first half of the year, no, second half of the year after June, um, then they'll probably turn 18 during the school year, uh, and there'll be students um, in the year 11-12 cohort, some of whom um, uh, could be 18 months, 19 months younger than them, and so. Uh, you've got them interacting with each other as peers, but the, the law doesn't deal with them in that fashion at, at all. So that, that's one of the, the factors here. So we wanted to understand um, uh, how sexual behaviour also develops. Uh, Chair. The question is the report be noted. Chair. The Honourable Matt Swin. Thank you. Um, we, we wanted to look at um, uh, how, how people, children, develop and, and how that developmental path uh, follows. Um, and, and those sorts of things. And I want to be very clear, we were not interested in this um, process in those people that um, engage in heinous um, uh, uh, acts of sexual violence uh, and, and crimes against um, children. Um, that's not what we were concerned with here. We're concerned with circumstances where you might have a 16-year-old and a 15-year-old engaged in uh, not legal consensual relations, but willing sexual relations, which is quite possible. Um, and then that, that, that there is a complaint. The law says that that is a uh, sexual offence. It doesn't matter about whether or not it was willing. Uh, and then those per people get caught up in the system. So I think, uh, as I say, the report covered that. We sought um, the advice of um, experts in the field. We spoke to a expert from Victoria, uh, whose name was... Um, Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Russell Pratt, Director of Prime Forensic Psychology. Um, uh, he was a Victorian expert. He was involved in the alterations or the um, uh, changes to the law in Victoria, which focused uh, more on a therapeutic approach to sexual offending in young people than a punitive one. Uh, he talked about um, the success that they had had in that, that they had moved away from the mandatory registration of children uh, over there into a system that was more designed around uh, getting young people back on track and um, back into pro-social behaviours rather than anti-social behaviours. And in terms of what we came across is that the perverse outcome of these, uh, uh, this, this register is that we do have people who offend. They do the wrong thing. They get dealt with by the criminal justice system. Um, the hope of the system is that we can rehabilitate them and put them back on a proper path. That should be the goal of that sort of, uh, of, our, of our justice system. There's no great controversy in that. Unfortunately, by including them in a system of mandatory uh, registration and reporting for up to seven and a half years as a child, you're essentially um, uh, putting a, um, you, you, you're sort of asking them to drag around a concrete block for the rest of their life in a metaphorical sense because um, uh, they then uh, uh, tarred with this brush of being a sex offender um, and a pedophile, and often that's not the nature of their crimes at all. Uh, and so you, you, you actually then have the opposite. So uh, the, the point about juvenile justice is to try and get children back into pro-social activities, not anti-social activities. But what we see, of course, is people who are on the register, they can't engage in peer-to-peer -peer, um, activities, they can't um, uh, they often have uh, restrictions in relation to um, other relatives. Uh, and all these other things in circumstances where there, be no, there might be no identifiable risk of reoffending, and that's really the issue where we, you know, um, that, that that is quite alarming, uh, and that we're putting that onto a young person to have to turn up to uh, Soames uh, to report. Uh, and to do that on a very regular basis. And we also had the evidence from them that the reporting requirements for many of these people are suspended almost immediately following conviction. So the, so the system is actually identifying them as not being um, a, a, of a significant risk to actually monitor them, but we put them onto the register anyway. So uh, we, we did our, we had uh, um, 30 written submissions that we received from a range of different groups and people. Um, some of those were received at, uh, privately, which, um, and those ones were um, very helpful for us. Um, you can imagine that some people didn't want to identify themselves publicly through the committee process, um, uh, and we were happy to take that evidence on that basis. We made 47 findings and 23 recommendations, and the government's response um, has been to um, accept those recommendations in full or in principle, which I greatly appreciate, and I hope uh, into the new parliamentary term uh, we are able to see some reforms. I think one of the other things that we saw through this process was almost a uniformity of view amongst those that are deal with this sex offender register that the discretion should be reintroduced. 
So we did hear evidence from the President of the Children's Court. We did hear evidence from the, um, uh, uh, the Chief uh, Magistrate. Um, uh, we did have evidence, I think, from the District Court. We had evidence from the, the, uh, uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions. We received evidence from the police, and they all agreed that discretion should be introduced. Um, and that was a change from the position that had existed previously when the Law Reform Commission had undertaken a report in 2011 uh, recommending that discretion be introduced. The police at that stage were not uh, probably equivocated in their position as to whether or not discretion should come back in it. But the police in this instance agreed that discretion should be there and that the legal process would actually identify those children or young people that should properly be included on the register and exclude those that, that, that shouldn't be included at all. Uh, and it was pleasing to have that. I'm not, I don't think going into it I thought that we would have that kind of response um, from those agencies and from those uh, uh, courts, but it was a, a relatively uniform um, point of view um, and uh, it was pleasing to have that. I don't think that's a very usual response. We did receive submissions or uh, previously had had submissions when we were making initial inquiries about the petition from a number of ministers who had also indicated that, um, that that discretion would probably be a better outcome in these circumstances. And that's really important. We get the people on the sex offender register that pose an actual risk to our community, and then we're not dealing with those that pose no discernible risk. So, uh, as I say, it was a pleasing uh, uh, inquiry to be in. It's probably the, uh, other than maybe the elder abuse inquiry that I did um, with the Honourable Nick Grant. It was actually the um, uh, probably the most enjoyable uh, par uh, committee process, uh, being able to deal with a, an issue of substance uh, and to make recommendations that hopefully will be useful. I have had people in the community who have taken interest um, in this report. Unfortunately, um, nobody. Um, there wasn't very much coverage of the report in the in the uh, uh, mass media, unfortunately. Um, uh, maybe not, not controversial enough for that sort of thing, um, but um, often our work does go unrecognised uh, more broadly uh, in, in, in those uh, spheres, the important work that the Legislative Council and its members do in these areas through these cross-party committees that um, uh, you know, put some great effort into that. But um, uh, I have had uh, forensic psychologists take an interest in it who work in the child protection field. I've had members of my community um, or the, uh, my constituents come to me, and I had a very recently uh, a man who uh, is the foster parent of a, uh, of a boy who uh, has uh, been put on the, the register as a 14-year-old um, for uh, uh, willing but not consensual relations with a sibling. Um, and uh, he, he presented to me the, the he's now 17 he was 14 when the offense happened but uh, you know as his foster parent he can't they can't take them overseas on a trip to Bali or anything else like that because they're on the sex offender register um, uh, they can't there's a range of other things he can't do like be involved in sport uh, you know there's restrictions on his schooling and a range of other issues and yet you know, there's no discernible risk in terms of him re-offending. Um, and so we're, how are we setting these people up for the rest of their lives when we include them uh, in this sort of area? And I, um, yes, um, children. And I think, you know, I come back to my opening line in my chairs forward, which is there would be few of us who have not made a mistake as a child when we would look back on them as an adult and wonder, what was I thinking? And I think most of those things that we, um, mistakes we made were minor and innocent, and some of them might be a bit more serious. But um, all of us here, perhaps with the exception of uh, the Honourable Aaron Stonehouse and uh, Kyle, the Honourable Kyle McGinn, uh, have grown up uh, out through our childhoods without social media, without smartphones, without those sort of things that happen now. Um, and so the, some of the behaviours that, um, uh, uh, that might have gone on, uh, innocently enough, um, are now not recorded and included. But at the generation of children that are coming through, my children, I have a 12, a 15 and a 17 year old, now live in a world where um, they can so easily be caught up in this system um, and through their naivety, um, their youth, their ignorance, uh, and end up um, uh, as a sex offender on the sex offender register. Um, and, you know, there was uh, not my direct family, but an extended family member uh, was involved in, you know, exchanging uh, pictures uh, through uh, uh, um, sexting, as it's called. Um, and 
uh, they were only uh, 12 or 13 when they were doing that, Her, uh, the, one of the, the female and the male, and they weren't related, they were from different parties. But if the, the, the police were involved and they said to both parents, if you prosecute, they'll both be prosecuted and they'll both end up on the sex offender register. And this behaviour was, while not acceptable, was of an innocent nature. And so um, as parents, as guardians of these children, we want to make sure then that they're not caught up in that for behaviours that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I say, relatively innocent, but not accepted by us in the community. And as I say, the committee was at pains to um, make the point that we weren't looking at the offences in themselves, we are just looking at the consequence of that. So as I say, it was a, a, a good, uh, um, inquiry to be involved in. We tried to be as thorough as we are. I was pleased with the government's um, uh, acceptance of the recommendations uh, and I look forward uh, in the new parliament uh, to the opportunity to potentially, um, fingers crossed if I get re-elected, um, to uh, uh, debate the, the uh, <laughs> chair. Just... Uh, do you wish to conclude? Uh, the, uh... I just want to have a few more concluding remarks. The, the Honourable Matt Swinburne. Just want to finish on this point about being re-elected chair. So, you know, if I get re-elected, dealing with legislation that reforms this area and hopefully uh, makes a smooth transition through both houses of parliament. Thank you, chair. The Honourable Ellison Zamon. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I've already spoken on this report and pointed out what an excellent report it is that I believe will stand the test of time and has, have indicated that whether I'm in or out of this place, I'll be using this as a resource in my advocacy. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm pleased that the Chair had the opportunity to stand up and speak comprehensively to this report because it, I think it's one of the better reports that has been tabled in this um, term, term of government. Um, having said that, I would, like, I would like to move that consideration of this report be um, postponed to the next day's sitting. The question is that motion be agreed to or, oh, well, whatever. or that it be noted actually. Actually, I'd like that it be noted. Uh, mm. Members, uh, of course I'll accept the, uh, any motion that members wish to put forward, but uh, it's unlikely that we will be meeting again. This is true. Just... Uh, so I don't know if you wish to conclude and note the report. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. I'd like, to, I'd like to move that the report be noted. Uh, members, uh, it, it, it's actually already been moved that the report be noted, and if there's that agreement, I'll put that question that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, next one is the Triple C Commission Report Number 13, the Annual Report 1819. The question, it has been moved uh, that the report be noted, and so the question is the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the next one is uh, another Triple C report, uh, this one number five from Words to Action, fulfilling the obligation to be child safe. Um, uh, further debate on the question that the report be noted. The Honourable uh, Sally Mr Thomas. Chair, it, it's not a Triple C report. Did you say another Triple C report? I, I'm sorry, I misread that. Um, the, uh, this one is item three on our list today, the Joint Standing Committee on the Commissioner for Children and Young People uh, report, uh, number five. Uh, the continuation, uh, or I give the call to the Honourable Sally Talbot on the question of the report be noted. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Sorry, it took a little while to get there. I just wanted to make sure I was speaking on the right report. I'm not going to take up much of the House's time. Um, having uh, spent the last uh, eight years on this um, standing, joint standing committee, um, the first four years under the chair of um, our colleague in the other place, uh, the member for Maylands, uh, Lisa Baker, and the um, uh, last four years uh, under the chair of, of me, um, Members who have paid attention to these things, as I know some people do, um, will notice that there is a theme going in this committee. So this report that uh, we're looking at now, from words to action, fulfilling the obligation to be child safe, um, is very much uh, a 
follow-up report to the report that this committee tabled at the end of the previous parliament, um, which was uh, again in, into a, a very similar um, subject area. So what happened, if I can just trace this timeline, because it is something that I think that the next parliament is going to want to uh, keep a very close eye on as we move through the next four years. Um, so if I can just run through a bit of the timeline so that members who perhaps haven't had their attention caught by this uh, series of reports from the Joint Standing Committee on the Commission of Children and Young People can have an idea about where they might start and why, indeed, I'll go as far as to say they ought to be paying attention uh, to the work of this committee. Nobody, of course, knows um, what the next committee will comprise or how the next committee will be comprised. Um, uh, and I'm not sure that having done so many years in it myself that, that I will once again be a member. But I must say, if anybody is contemplating that, I've found it uh, enormously worthwhile to do. I can see the, I, I've attracted the attention of the Honourable Alison Zamon. It, it, is, um, it has the potential to be one of the most effective committees in this place. Um, we have been um, extraordinarily fortunate in Western Australia in the two long-term Children's Commissioners that we've had. Uh, uh, and I do pay tribute to the Commissioner whose term has just been extended for a further year, um, Colin Pettit, who I think has, has done uh, a very, very good job of um, bringing some very important issues to the attention of the West Australian public. And he's, he's done some, some good work in heading that team uh, in the Commissioner's office, and he would be the first to acknowledge that it is the work of the team that pays off uh, when you pay tribute to a body of work. Um, his, his work is of such a standard uh, that it's now um, there are frequently occasions when it's the West Australian Children's Commissioner's Office who is tasked by the national uh, body that meets as the, I don't know quite what they call themselves, but it's almost like a federated meeting of, it's like the COAG that you have of children's commissioners, particularly now we have a, a Commonwealth Children's Commissioner. And it's frequently the West Australian Commissioner who is um, asked to carry out certain pieces of work that then goes to the Children's Commissioners uh, group that meet regularly um, and is acted on by them. So I think that's something that we should be very proud of in Western Australia. I think Michelle Scott, our first Children's Commissioner, set the bar very high and I think we've been lucky so far. There was a hiatus and I think it's an area that the incoming committee and the next parliament needs to look at quite closely. There remains some confusion, and it's, it's a matter of uh, uh, just a, a, a modicum of personal regret for me that this committee um, uh, didn't have its attention drawn quickly enough to the existence of this, this slight confusion about the process for appointing a new commissioner. And I think it's something that the next committee could look at very closely and uh, perhaps fix up. Uh, given that uh, commissioners are, are term limited. Um, there was a review of the, of the uh, Act, the Children's Commissioners Act, uh, a few years ago, and one of the recommendations from that review was to clarify the process of appointing a new commissioner. And I, I'm um, sorry to say that that hasn't really been done to effectively yet, and I think that's an, an outstanding task that um, this committee will have to defer to the, to the committee in the next parliament. Um, but to come back directly to this report, I was going to just go through the timeline so that uh, it, the association between this report uh, from words to action, is, you can see the links between this report and the previous report, which was called um, Everybody's Business. So uh, many members would be very familiar with the um, Blacksaw inquiry, which was set up to inquire into the situation at uh, St Andrew's Hostel. Um, and I do I think it's appropriate that I should pay tribute to my colleague in the other place, Peter Watson, who was the person who uh, came across the, um, he came across a couple of people who had direct involvement. I believe that they were parents whose children had attended St Andrew's Hostel in Katani. And it was Peter Watson who came across these people and was so, 
shocked by what he was hearing, that he brought it to um, his party room, and his party room considered it, and uh, it was, it was uh, very much with the support of the Labour Party that Peter was able to push to have the inquiry set up. Um, it was obviously, uh, Labour was in opposition at that time, but uh, it was a very, it, it was an appalling situation. It was as bad as any situation uh, 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 involving child sexual abuse that we've seen anywhere in the world. And in fact, when the committee in its previous iteration, in the previous parliament, so the committee who did the work on the first report, Everybody's Business, when we undertook some investigative travel uh, overseas, we made sure that we went to jurisdictions where they had uh, encountered problems like the problems that had occurred in St Andrews Hostel in Katanning and had acted quickly to, put, to, to change the system, to put new processes and, and mechanisms in place to ensure it could never happen again. So we made sure we went to those jurisdictions and obviously one of them was, was Dublin um, because they, they had had a, a particularly egregious examples of, of child sexual abuse uh, in, in occurring at the institutional level. And the thing that we found very, very quickly was that we had to explain to all the witnesses that we encountered, you know, we weren't travelling with, with Hansard. Um, I will, will also draw members' attention to the fact that the, the, this, the committee who wrote this second report that we're considering today um, undertook a similar tranche of investigations. Um, and indeed, we actually came across the same witnesses a couple of times. It was very, very interesting to talk to people uh, several years apart and to get an idea about how different jurisdictions were progressing the measures that they put in place to uh, prevent child sexual abuse and respond quickly to child sexual abuse where it, where it did occur. Um, but what we found on that first trip was that we had to explain to people that the children who were the victims of the child sexual abuse in Katanning were not children who were regarded in any way as vulnerable. So they were not in the system, in, in inverted commas. They were not children in care. They were not children who were institutionalised. The children at St Andrew's Hostel were simply attending the local high school and because their families lived more than a drive, more than a reasonable drive away from the local high school, they were boarding at the hostel in town. So these were not children who were regarded as vulnerable. Uh, what that showed us was that there is no such thing as a child who's not vulnerable when you have perpetrators in your community. And uh, I, I would challenge any member in this House to read the Blacksall report. Unlike a lot of judicial reports, um, Blacksall is eminently readable. He wrote it to be read. And I'd challenge anybody to read it from the beginning of chapter one to, I think it's got 19 chapters, that's just from memory, but say 20 chapters. Read those 20 chapters cover to cover and you won't you, you won't be able to not be reduced to, to weeping when you read it. It's absolutely shocking. I know we've had um, uh, some media reports this week of uh, senior people, ministers, senior bureaucrats, reading reports and being reduced to being physically ill when they, when they read them. Well, I can tell you that Blacksall did that to me and I've yet to meet anybody who's read it cover to cover who wasn't similarly moved. So it was with Blacksell in mind that uh, the previous iteration of the committee embarked on writing the report, um, Everybody's Business. The question is the report be noted, uh, the continuation of the introductory remarks of the Honourable Sir. Th thank, thanks, Mr Chair. <laughs> Um, I, I, what I might do is, I, I, I do want to um, get through all my remarks, so what I might do is sit after the next 10 minutes just to see whether anybody else seeks the call. I, I, I don't actually want this report to be, um, uh, you know, not to spend our full time on it, so I'll just, everybody here will know what I'm planning we're, we're to do. We're all listening intently. Thanks, Mr Chair. I know you always do. Um, so, it was... Um, Examining the response to the Blacksaw report that motivated the committee in its previous iteration to embark on the everybody's business process. 
Um, because what happened was that uh, Blacksall put forward a couple of very uh, specific recommendations that involved the work of the Children's Commissioner. So it was clearly within the terms of reference of the Joint Standing Committee that we should have a very close look on what these recommendations might mean. Uh, one, of course, always has to have an eye to the practical uh, resource implications of any recommendations of this kind, uh, uh, but also to the kind of um, uh, cultural expectations that are driving the recommendations. So the one that we looked at most closely was the recommendation for some kind of, and I'm going to now use the uh, uh, Peter Blacksall's original uh, terminology uh, for this, although he did subsequently say that he thought that he had probably um, made the argument slightly more complex than it should have been by using this terminology, that originally what he refers to in the Blacksall report recommendations is a one-stop shop uh, for, the, um, for, for, for reporting and management of <laughs> allegations about child sexual abuse. Now, the reason he did this was very specific. And of course, um, uh, honourable members who've got any uh, familiarity with budget processes and resourcing of agencies uh, will know that if anybody stands up and starts talking about a one-stop shop for something as big as child sexual abuse, um, that it's going to ring Treasury's alarm bells because immediately they see a big empire being established. And so they get very nervous. But I believe, I still believe very strongly after many years of considering this issue um, uh, you know, very closely, that what motivated, I should give him his full title, the Honourable Peter Blacksall, um, it, what motivated him to make that recommendation was the fact that and you can see it writ large in the Blacksall report, that for many, many children, the most traumatic part of being sexually abused it occurs after the reporting of that abuse. So it's the constant retelling of the story. It's the, um, the, the, the processes that we have in place through the judicial system for, for um, dealing with allegations of, of, of that kind. Um, it, it, it's, it's a shocking thing. I mean, it makes me um, ashamed to live in a community where we have set up a system like that. I have to say that over the years that this has been such a, a um, current issue in Western Australia, I have to say that tribute needs to be paid to the police uh, department, who have now got what is regarded as um, a world's best practice uh, system within the police department. So the police department was very, very proactive. Obviously, they were right at the the, um, the cutting edge of delivery of the the mechanisms that swing into place once a child has made an allegation. And they now have a system in place which is the object of admiration all over the world. Everywhere you travel in the world and talk about these issues, you will find that people will talk about what we've done in Western Australia with the police department. And I think that there are several individuals who I don't have time to name here who deserve to be highly commended for the work that they've done there. It, it turns that shame and embarrassment that you initially experience when you read the Blacksaw report into something, you know, that you can actually be quite proud of that we've done that. Um, so, as I've said, the the, the difficulty uh, in talking about Blacksall and the recommendations uh, overseas was that people automatically assumed that you were talking about vulnerable children. Um, we had to point out that that wasn't the case. Uh, we then uh, move forward to the uh, National Royal Commission into um, Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. And of course, what comes out of that report, I know some members have, if not waded through the entire um, dozen or so volumes, will at least be familiar with the recommendations. Again, what we had was uh, uh, accounts of victims who were Many of them, of course, were children who were in the care of the state or whatever the equivalent state system in various jurisdictions might have been. Many of them were indeed uh, very vulnerable and um, had the terrible misfortune to be exposed to people who were quite happy to take advantage of their vulnerability. But a lot of them weren't. 
A lot of them were children whose parents thought they were doing the right thing by taking them to music lessons and, and uh, you know, after school activities and sports clubs, you know, they thought they were doing the right thing. And it's, it's now, um, you, you know, decades later that people have had to live with the fact that many of those uh, clubs and, and associations that we've sent our children to in the past weren't safe for children. So that's, that's really the starting point for this, the generation of this report that we're considering today from words to action. What we wanted to do was go back to two specific recommendations of the National Royal Commission. Um, the state government uh, had already agreed to enact all the relevant uh, recommendations, all the recommendations that were relevant for the state to respond to, we're going to enact them all. But of course it's a massive process because you're not just in, engaged in uh, cultural change you know, or legislative change in a very small area. What you're engaged in is a really a mass um, change of consciousness across a whole sector of, of, of service delivery. And I mean, um, it surprised me that uh, when we talked to witnesses from the Department of Premier and Cabinet, um, they were talking about thousands and thousands of organisations who potentially were captured by the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Um, that's a very big job, and so I think that the government has quite rightly set itself a, a 10-year timeline for implementing all the recommendations. There, there are hundreds of them that need to be um, uh, um, enacted. And uh, we've already done some of them, of course. So, um, uh, you know, so some of the very important ones have, have, have already seen action. So what this report does is to delve down into how the state might go about handling, in particular, um, two areas um, uh, that uh, uh, that are included in the National Royal Commission's recommendations and the Blacksall Report. So we were looking, if you can imagine Euler's circles, we were looking at the, uh, at the uh, recommendations that were captured by everything that has, is now on the public record. You know, where do we go when the, in the areas where we've got common agreement that there's a need for action? What is that action actually going to look like? And that's why, um, that's the, the genesis for the title of the report, From Words to Action. Uh, what, that's, what that is supposed to capture is that nobody needs to go out and generate more words about this. It might sound a bit ironic that I say that in the context of a report that I, was, uh, that I chaired the, the writing of, um, but you know, we don't need any more royal commissions or judicial surveys. What we need to do now is actually do something, and we know now what to do. So, and there's wide consensus about the need to do those things. So, um, when looking at all the evidence that was already on the public record, the committee focused specifically on recommendations related to two things. The first uh, relates to uh, child safe standards, and the second is the provision of independent oversight. Now, there's one more um, body of work that I have to refer to here just to set this scene. And that is the oversight report, where we, we, we call it, the shorthand version is the oversight report of the Children's Commissioner. Anybody who wants to find it, just go onto the Commissioner's website and uh, just search on oversight and you will find his 2017 report where he looked at six different areas of service delivery and gave us recommendations about what needed to be done to improve oversight. Now, the, the crucial point here that, that I think we can agree to, I think it's one of those things where when you hear me say this, you'll think, well, of course, she's stating the obvious. But when you actually start to peel away the onion skins, what you find is that people have no idea how the intellectual agreement with the proposition does not translate into action. And, and, and the first of those, um, the first of those, uh, Mr. Chair, is that... Um, we have to put the interests of children first. Uh, you know, you say, well, yes, you know, if you're running a, a, a sports club, you know, you're teaching kids to play footy or you're... Question is the report be noted. Uh, the Honourable Donna, Donna Farragher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm 
Mr Chairman, look, I, um, I do want to rise just to make a couple of brief comments um, with regard uh, to the report as a member of uh, this committee. I, I will keep my comments fairly short because there are a number of um, reports that are, are before us and I'm sure members would like to have the opportunity uh, to speak to those as well. But look, I, I um, endorse a, a number of the comments that have been made by the Honourable Sally Talbot with regard to um, the genesis uh, of this um, report and how we came um, to investigate it um, in great length. Um, I, I think it is true to say that the committee was very thorough uh, in its examination of the issue. That is by no means um, an easy one to grapple with, um, and perhaps that is why it is actually so very important um, that it was examined so intensely for a number of men, uh, months um, by the committee um, to help provide um, a framework um, and an understanding of the matters that must be addressed if we are to truly have organisations, both government and non-government, that are child uh, safe. Now, it, it is certainly um, clear to me, and it was certainly clear to me uh, throughout the various um, meetings and discussions um, and hearings that we held with, uh, throughout this inquiry, both here as well as, um, as, well as overseas, that um, effective independent oversight is an absolute must when it comes to this area. Um, but that oversight is not one that can be um, cursory. It is not one that can be um, a ticker box exercise um, with the hope that if I tick that, then all will be well um, and all children will be okay. Um, child abuse um, in any form um, is absolutely abhorrent. Um, far too often we have seen um, individuals fail our children. Um, far too often we have seen organisations fail our children. Ultimately, um, it is a matter for all of us, um, a matter for all of us to get this right. Um, and we must ensure, and this has certainly been noted throughout the report, that we do need um, wholesale cultural change um, in a range of aspects. Now, as uh, the Honourable Sally Talbot has said, and, and for those members who um, have not read the report yet, I, I do commend it to them. We were very thorough in our examination um, of the issues, and we make a number of recommendations, particularly around independent oversight, um, information sharing, which I think is a critical issue, um, but there are also another, a number of other areas um, that have been canvassed. And as a result of this inquiry, um, Further work uh, has been done with regard to perhaps providing greater opportunities for the voices of children to be heard uh, throughout the parliamentary uh, process as well. But most of all, I think it is fair to say that this um, report, and there have of course been many reports, we have had a Royal Commission, um, and this um, I would like to think adds helpfully um, to the debate and the discussion. Um, this report is a call to action. Um, the title of the report is From Words to Action, Fulfilling the Obligation to be Child Safe. Um, and I just want to leave members um, with a couple of quotes, um, which I think I don't like to speak for other members, um, but I think if I was to do so, I, I think they probably would agree um, with me that we met with many, many people um, across a range of areas, both government and non-government. Um, but you know, there are some meetings where um, the words that are expressed and the conversations that you have really stand out. Um, and there was one particular um, meeting that we had uh, in London uh, with Sarah Blakemore, who was the Chief Executive of Keeping Children Safe. And that meeting was held on the 8th of October um, 2019, and I remember that meeting um, very well. And the report refers um, to something uh, that she said. Um, she said, the more transparent we can be, the more we can learn from our mistakes. We all know stories of people who turned away when they shouldn't. There are stories of people who have actively covered abuse up, but there are millions of stories of people who have not looked too hard. 
If we are not clear about what is expected of us as individuals and we do not support that process in a transparent way, we will continue to have child abuse because the perpetrators look just like the other people who are not trying to stop the situation. If we can re be really clear and empower people and make them not be frightened, then they will do the right thing. Otherwise, I think many people will think, I'll just stay in my lane. Um, Mr Chairman, um, it is our responsibility, both in this House um, and out within the community, and it is the responsibility of the community um, to not just talk about how we might do things better um, or how we might address these issues. And whilst there might be time frames that governments want to um, deliver on certain things, there comes a point where we must um, move, as the report suggests, from words um, to action. That is only then that we will truly be able to protect um, our most vulnerable, which is our children. Um, and you know these sort of reports, you hear very harrowing matters. They, as I've said, they are not easy things. This is this is not a fun and thinking sort of issue that that people want to all talk about. But we actually have to talk about it. We have to talk about it, and we don't. But we don't just talk about it. We've actually got to do something about it. Um, and I, I just want to. Um, again, end with a quote that was again made by Sarah Blakemore, and it is one that, in fact, probably would have also been a good um, title for the report. Uh, and, it sa and she said, organisations must be clear. This is what good looks like. We know what bad looks like. But this is what good looks like, and this is what you can do to achieve it. Mr Chairman, um, we all know what bad looks like. It's horrific when it comes to the issue of child abuse. So what we need to do, we need to know what good looks like. And I think we all know what good looks like. We just have to have the will to be able to deliver upon it, um, and then as she says, we can actually move forward in a positive way. And I would like to think um, that this report, as well as the many others that have been done, will actually be a call uh, for action and will actually be taken on quite seriously by this government and, if need be, successive governments. But I don't really want to be in this place in two, three, four years' time or even when I'm out of here, I don't want to actually see reports like this. I don't want to continue to see reports about issues surrounding how we have not actually addressed in a proper way matters surrounding child abuse um, and protecting our most vulnerable. Um, we shouldn't have to be continuing to, to do these sorts of reports for actually activity um, to be done. So again, I just... Um, I just leave you again with that quote. This is what good looks like. We know what bad looks like, but this is what good looks like, and this is what you can do to achieve it, Mr Chairman. I commend the report to the House. The question is the report be noted. The Hon. Alison Zamong. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise just to make a few quick comments about, um, this, about this report um, from words to action. And I want to thank the committee for doing, um, doing the good work um, behind this and, and, for, and for following through on the themes um, as has, has, has just been outlined by the Honourable um, Sally Talbot, because this is an issue which I know has plagued successive governments uh, in terms of how we make sure we are moving forward with a framework um, statutory as well as um, governmental that is going to uh, improve the area of, of addressing is issues of child abuse. Um, I particularly want to make some comments about, the, about um, Chapter 7, which talks about the need for independent oversight. And this is an area that I've spoken about numerous times um, in this place um, over, the over the course of the last four years, because it is a, it is a significant gap. Um, if you actually reflect on other areas of vulnerable populations, we've done a good job of ensuring that we have got appropriate statutory
statutory and funded mechanisms to provide uh, both systemic and individual support. I think, for example, of the Office of Inspector of Custodial Services, which is unique in our state and a, and a model which um, I know uh, should be replicated around the country, which enables that independent oversight of how what is happening for um, people who are being detained within our prisons and prisoners, and uh, report directly to Parliament as well, and using uh, individual um, advocacy uh, to be able to highlight where there are systemic concerns. Likewise, we've got the Chief Mental Health Advocate and the role that plays for people who are subject to the Mental Health Act, as well as a range of other people in the mental health system who uh, are classified as being vulnerable populations. These are examples of where we've been able to uh, identify mechanisms to both provide individual support for vulnerable individuals at the same time as provide systemic oversight and to be able to ensure that those reporting mechanisms are come back, coming back into Parliament. And so it is a significant gap when you talk about children in particular who are brought into care. That, um, that there is no um, same, there's no similar um, body uh, that can that does uh, that sort of that scope of of both individual and systemic advocacy, and that does leave children very vulnerable. I feel absolutely positive I'm not the only member in this place who, through the course of um, their parliamentary career, has been contacted uh, by um, either families who have had children removed or foster carers um, who have issues that they want to be able to have raised, and there is effectively nowhere for them to go other than straight to um, the department that they see as being the source of, of the distress and the concern, and sometimes um, quite and sometimes um, quite problematic. Conduct. Uh, and so this, this idea of needing to have uh, independent oversight, um, a clear resourced um, um, agency and that has the authority and has the capacity to report straight to parliament is one that has been talked about for quite a while. And I note that there is a number of findings um, that have identified um, issues of existing gaps uh, and have identified um, how they need to, how they interlap into overlap with uh, recommendations arising out of the Royal Commission and um, the concerns about the lack of advocacy services. Um, there are, of course, um, recommendations that have arisen as a result, so a simple one, that attention be given to improving access to independent individual advocacy for children in care as a priority, and that consideration be given to the immediate provision of additional resources for the advocate of children in care until a long-term um, solution is developed. Um, these are, I think, solutions that need to be given very serious contemplation by government. Um, and I think that uh, what this, what this um, particular report, report number five, has managed to do is to encapsulate um, all the immediate concerns and provide a bit of a framework, both short term and as well as um, a long term vision for what it is we need to do. It's really going to come down to ensuring that we've got the political will to, to enact that. And I think this is a report that hopefully is going to be um, made reference to in future governments. I may, or may, I may or may not be in the parliament at that point, but I'm certainly hopeful that a future committee is going to, as a matter of priority, go back to the reports that have been issued and pick up on these themes, because I think it would be devastating if this important work were lost. The question is the report be noted. Those of that opinion, uh, the Honourable El Sally Talbot. Close it off then. So um, I I'm, uh, really appreciate that contribution from both the Honourable Alison Zaman, who was not a member of the committee, and uh, the Honourable Donna Farragher. Um, it's, it's been a really productive committee, I think, the last four years. Um, it, the Honourable Donna Farragher and I were the two representatives of this place, and then we had um, two people whose names I can't remember from the other place. <laughs> I can. No, I was just being. I was just being um, respectful of our place. <laughs> um, Karen O'Donnell was my deputy chair, and uh, Jess Stokowski, member for Kingsley, was the other member. So I do pay tribute to those. Also to the two staff members we worked with, Renee Gould and Michelle Kiesen, did a fantastic job um, of helping us navigate through through the process. But I did um, thank you, the Honourable Donna Farragher, for um, paying tribute to Sarah Blakemore. She was one of the people, obviously, that I wanted to um, note uh, in her. I think she really shaped our thinking by talking about um, 
the practical challenges. Um, Ms Blakemore's background is that she, um, as the Honourable Donna Farragher says, works with an organisation called Keeping Children Safe. Um, one of their main tasks at the moment is uh, delivering um, uh, programmes about how to effectively keep children safe to UN peacekeepers all over the world. So people of many, many different nationalities who come together under, you know, under the Blue Beret, essentially, as United Nations peacekeepers. And she said that what you have to ask yourself is why, on so many occasions, uh, when you start talking about not, sexual, not sexually abusing children, uh, somebody in the group will say, but what if? As though that's an option, indeed, the Honourable uh, Alison Zamon. It absolutely um, makes you freeze in your spot when you hear the, 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 some of the graphic accounts that she gave us. So, you know, what if the child has a loaded gun in their hand? And of course, they're, they're the realities that UN peacekeepers face, not, perhaps not every day, but as a routine part of their, their lives. So, yes, what the, the account that Ms Blakemore gave us, indeed, was very, very significant in guiding our thinking. And, and I will admit, thank you, the Honourable Dolan Farragher, for, not, um, for, for being very tactful in the way you walked around the... Uh, I'm sorry, she's had to leave the chamber on her parliamentary business, but she was very tactful in saying that we actually had our title stolen from us by the Public Accounts Committee, who a few... Weeks before we finalised our report, put out a report called What Does Good Look Like? And I know that uh, there were at least four people in these two Houses of Parliament who thought, oh, blow, we can't call it that then, can we? Because that was going to be our, our title. So, um, yes, that was very significant. The other moment for me that I think is worth very briefly um, remarking as I come to the end of my comments was um, Professor Helen Milroy, who appeared before us and was, of course, a, a, a member of the National Royal Commission. And uh, I found her uh, comments extremely helpful in guiding us towards a very practical approach to how we can make things better. So as I can say, as I was saying, um, it is an important uh, report to read. It, it is. I'm glad that this report is about to be noted by this House. Um, the two issues of uh, oversight and child safe standards are absolutely fundamental to putting in place a system where uh, we can actually do things better. So that um, I think those two great failures will be rectified once organisations embed the national child safe principles into the heart of their operations all organisations dealing with children, and that the failure to effectively assess and monitor the capacity of institutions to put the interests of children first will be addressed when independent oversight renders systems transparent. Thank you. Uh, members, the question is the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We have a few minutes to consider. Fair enough. <laughs> I will report to the House. To Steve Thomas. Uh, Mr. Acting President, the Committee of the Whole House has considered the uh, Environment and Public Affairs Report 52, noted same, Triple C Report number 13, and noted same, and the Commissioner for Children and Young People Report number 5, and noted same. Minister of the Environment. Mr. President, I move that the report be adopted. The question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. Uh, orders of the day. Yes. Simon, are you happy to come back into? Oh. I'll have to do the first order of the day if you don't mind jumping back in. Leader of the House. Oh, thank you. I move without notice that orders of the day numbers one and two be taken after order of the day number 43. And the question is that. Uh, that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Think the ayes have it. Uh, brings us to order of the day number three, the animal welfare, transport, sale yards and depots. Cattle and sheep regulations 2020 disallowance. Um, uh, moved pro forma on the 20th of October on the motion of the 
Hon. Dr Steve Thomas uh, that the Animal Welfare Transport Sale Yards and Depots Cattle and Sheep Regulations 2020, published in the Gazette on 2 October 2020 and tabled in the Legislative Council on 8 October 2020, under the Animal Welfare Act 2002, be and are hereby disallowed. The question is that motion be agreed. The Hon. Dr Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, can I just seek your guidance? I have a motion to move and I'd like to make some comments. Would you prefer that I move the motion and made some brief comments or made some brief comments and moved the motion? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really up to you, uh, uh, Member, but it might help facilitate the understanding of what we're, the scope of the debate if you were to move the motion. Certainly, I'll take your guidance, Mr Deputy President. So, Mr Deputy President, um, I would like to move without notice that order of the day number three, animal welfare, transport sale yards and depots, cattle and sheep regulations 2020, be discharged from the notice paper. Uh, member, I think uh, what you're uh, wanting uh, to do um, uh, is clear and that you uh, wish there to be some discussion of this matter uh, and then you'd like the House to discharge Yes, the matter. So perhaps I should have, um, perhaps I should have made my remarks and then moved the disallowance, moved the uh, withdrawal motion. In, I, I think um, it might be best if we uh, entertain um, some comments of explanation from the Honourable Dr. Steve. Thomas, and I think the best way to do that is to give him leave to do so, and I think he's requesting that. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. The Honourable Dr Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I uh, thank the House uh, for that privilege. I just want to make a very couple of very brief comments. Uh, this uh, disallowance motion came about on the basis that there were some difficulties, in, in my view, in the transport regulations uh, that would have made it difficult for truck drivers to avoid uh, absolute uh, responsibility in a way that was impossible for them to fulfil. That is, if you're loading a significant number of animals, if you were to take the time to fully inspect each animal before you load them, it might take you hours uh, to do that job properly. If you're going to uh, effectively check 600 or 1,000 sheep on a truck or, or 200 or 250 cattle on a truck uh, and inspect them, each one, before it goes up to make sure there's no lameness, that would take a little while. So uh, I appreciate the fact that when I've raised the disallowance and I've raised this with the minister, the Minister has um, uh, taken that on board. Uh, I thank her for doing so. The Minister has come up with a defence uh, which would allow at least some protection for the transport industry. Now, I might add that um, in, in, in around comments around the transport industry, of course, uh, they've all, many have come back and said the amendment doesn't go far enough. We want absolute protection over everything. Uh, my view is that the uh, uh, we have the capacity to make it better, and if everybody's a little bit unhappy, we're probably roughly where we need to be. So I just want to take this opportunity to explain that that is the reason we're doing what we're doing. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Minister for Agriculture for taking this issue on board uh, and thank her staff for the way in which they've dealt with this issue. Uh, I'll be making some more public comment, but I think it, I think it just occasionally demonstrates that when you raise a sensible issue and seek um, and, and, and seek a, a, a frank discussion on it. You occasionally uh, get good results, and, and I'm pleased that the minister has accepted this in good faith. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, the uh, thank you for, for that, the uh, honourable Dr. Steve Thomas. Um, the uh, on. I'll take it then as a, uh, to, to facilitate debate, because I think the Minister might wish to say a, f a few words. In that, in that case, it's a, it's a slightly unusual situation. Um, so what I'll um, uh, do is I will receive the motion without notice from the Honourable Dr Steve 
Thomas, uh, Thomas that the uh, regulation, uh, the disallowance motion, be discharged from the notice paper. The question is that motion be agreed to. The Honourable uh, the Minister for Agriculture. Uh, look, uh, look, I really do um, thank the Honourable uh, Steve Thomas for approaching me with his, uh, his concerns, and uh, we were very, uh, uh, very keen to resolve this issue. Uh, these um, uh, these uh, uh, regulations uh, are actually un underpinned by the national standards and guidelines that were agreed to in 2012, but effect never put into effect in Western Australia. Uh, uh, now, there is always, when you transfer these things into a regulation, obviously there can um, be some, you know, they develop more force, obviously, and we were, we, it's certainly not our intention uh, that truck drivers be required to examine every individual, that uh, every individual animal that is on their, um, uh, on their, uh, being loaded onto their vehicle. Um, we believe that the responsibility would be the driver to make sure uh, that they have a statement from the owner that they have uh, the the owner of the animals that they have uh, uh, done the inspection and of course to be there and physically watch the loading so if there is anything very obvious um, you can't just get the piece of paper and go and have a smoke while uh, uh, while the animals are being loaded but it's not it's certainly uh, not our intention to create um, any um, uh, obligation that would be very, very difficult and impractical to discharge. So I'm glad we've been able to work through those issues and, and have um, uh, something that I think will work well and prove animal welfare without it creating an undue burden for the truck uh, livestock transporters. It must have been moved that the, uh, the order of the day be discharged from the notice paper. The question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, members, that brings us now to uh, order of the day number 37, the Swan Valley Planning Bill 20. No, ma ma sorry. I'm sorry, the Minister for Agriculture? Yes, I, I move that um, bills for introduction be now taken. Uh, the question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Bills for introduction. The Minister for Agriculture and Food. I move the motion standing in my name. Uh, members, uh, the, uh, the Parliamentary Secretary uh, to the Minister for Agriculture uh, and Food moved, uh, gave notice of a motion to introduce a bill. Uh, which has now been moved by the Minister for Agriculture and Food that a bill for an act to provide the regulation of the practice of veterinary medicine in Western Australia and to facilitate the regulation of the practice of veterinary, veterinary science, uh, veterinary medicine on a national basis and to repeal the Veterinary Surgeons Act 1960 and the Veterinary Surgeons Regulations 1979 and to make consequential amendments to various acts and for related purposes be introduced and read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Veterinary Practice Bill 2020 first reading. The Minister for Agriculture. Uh, I move that the bill now be read a second time. Uh, this bill will modernise the regulation of veterinary practice in Western Australia. It is now 60 years since the Veterinary Surgeons Act, the current Act, was passed by the WA Parliament, and bringing it into line with current practices and other Australian jurisdictions and with the modern day economy is long overdue. Veterinary services and pet care make an increasing, an ever increasing contribution to the WA economy. Australia has one of the highest proportions of pet ownership in the world, and in 2018-19, Australian households spent over 13 billion on their pets, with veterinary services contributing approximately four billion dollars to the economy. Uh, this is expected to continue to grow over coming years. 
Veterinary practitioners will also play a vital role in providing livestock owners with animal health, welfare and production advice, and by investigating, preventing, controlling and treating disease. They are an integral part of programs for detecting and responding to significant animal disease incidents in Australia. These activities support now protect and protect our valuable <coughs> export markets. WA's livestock sector is a significant and, and important contributor to, to the state economy. The gross value of agricultural production from WA cattle industry is $828 million and sheep is uh, $1.5 billion. Commensurate with this growing demand for veterinary services, the number of veterinarians in WA has been steadily increasing in recent years, and from 2012 to 2018 it increased by 13 per cent. This growth can be attributed to the increased number of veterinary schools in Australia, which has gone for seven, uh, four to seven in the past decade. A rapidly growing industry requires a modern regulation, which this bill will deliver. Part two of the bill introduces the mutual recognition of veterinarians re registered in other, other Australian jurisdictions. In 2006, a national recognition of veterinarian scheme was endorsed, endorsed by the Council of Australian Governments, Primary Industries Ministerial Council. And in 2015, the Australian Productivity Commission recommended mutual recognition of veterinarians in its research report on mutual recognition schemes. The introduction of, a mutual, of mutual recognition of veterinarians in the bill will bring WA into line with uh, other Australian states in the ACT. Mutual recognition removes barriers for veterinarians working across state borders, including those assisting temporarily in state emergencies. It will enable veterinarians registered interstate to practice in WA without having to apply for WA registration unless and until they move their principal place of residence to Western Australia for more than three months. The bill also introduces registration of WA veterinary nurses, making WA the first Australian uh, jurisdiction to do so. This inclusion in the bill is supported by WA veterinary nurses and the veterinary community as a whole. It will serve to lift the profile of veterinary nurses within the profession and properly reflects the significant responsibility that veterinary nurses discharge. Bringing veterinary nurses within the formal legislative framework of the bill will also allow the Veterinary Practice Board to better respond to concerns of unprofessional conduct or impairment relating to veterinary nurses. There is evidence that veterinarians experience higher than average levels of depression, anxiety, stress and burnout compared to the general population. Contributing factors include long working hours, person, personnel issues, poor work-life balance and compassion fatigue. Impairment such as substance abuse and mental and physical disorders can detrimentally affect the ability of a veterinarian or a veterinary nurse to practice competently and safely. The current Act does not provide a formal alternative option other than for the Veterinary Surgeons Board to refer a veterinarian who is suffering from impairment to the State Administrative Tribunal for the matter to be dealt with as a complaint. This can be extremely stressful and can exacerbate the impairment. The bill enables the board to deal with these impairments separately from unprofessional conduct matters. In separating impairment from professional conduct processes, the bill ensures that a veterinarian or veterinary nurse suffering from an impairment is dealt with in a more sympathetic, sympathetic and constructive manner and is not subjected to the suite of investigative processes for complaints. As such, a finding of an impairment under the bill does not in its own attract punitive penalties. This allows support for the mental and physical health of veterinar veterinarians and veterinary nurses, while simultaneously reducing the risk of negative, negative impacts for their clients. Uh, 
Importantly, impairment will only fall within the provisions of the bill if it detrimentally affects the veterinary practitioner's ability to practice veterinary medicine or to work as a veterinary nurse. An impairment which does not have this effect due to its nature or because it has been effectively managed will not be dealt with under this bill. In response to deregulation initiatives in 1995, when national competition policy reforms lifted restrictions on the ownership of veterinary practices, uh, the bill allows non-veterinarians to own a veterinary practice, bringing WA into line with all other Australian jurisdictions except New South Wales. Consequently, veterinarians will be able to own and operate veterinary practices provided a registered veterinarian makes all decisions relating to veterinary treatment and care. Part 6 of the bill allows the board to make a, an immediate action order in relation to a veterinarian or veterinary surgeon if it is satisfied that there is an imminent risk of substantial industry injury or harm to a person including the veterinarian, veterinary nurse or to an animal. Immediate uh, action orders uh, will operate in these circumstances to restrict or prohibit veterinarians or veterinary nurses for practicing up to 28 days. Procedural fairness through a show call mechanism is embedded in this process and the board's decision to make immediate action order is reviewable by the SAT. Many Australian jurisdictions have legislated to allow their veterinary boards to take immediate action to restrict or prevent a veterinarian from practising veterinary medicine in certain specified circumstances, and the inclusion of similar provisions in the bill will bring WA into line with those jurisdictions. Part 7 of the bill returns to the board the power to deal with minor disciplinary matters. The current board lost this power in 2005 when SAT was established. Subsequently, the current board has had to refer all disciplinary matters to the SAT. In May 2009, however, a report by the Standing Committee on Legislation concluded that the current board should regain the head of power to deal with minor disciplinary matters and to impose penalties such as a fine or reprimand. As a result, the bill introduces a two-tier system of handling unprofessional conduct uh, by veterinarians and veterinary nurses. The lower tier will be dealt with directly by the board, and whilst more serious conduct matters in the upper tier will be dealt with by SAT. Another key feature of the bill is that it increases the membership of the board from, eight, from five to eight members. This reflects the need to include a veterinary nurse in light of the registration of veterinary nurses been included in the bill and the recognition of the need to include consumer and legal representatives to ensure a balanced overview of matters before the board. All members will be appointed by the minister responsible for administering the act when passed. This aligns with veterinary practice legislation in other Australian uh, jurisdictions and with other WA boards, such as the Teachers Registration Board and the Architects Board of WA. I'm confident that this bill and its framework will establish, uh, it will establish, will serve our state as uh, we meet the challenges of the next 15 to 20 years and will help the veterinary profession to continue to make a substantial, significant contribution to the WA economy. Pursuant to Legislative Council Standing Order 126, bracket 1, I advise that this bill is a uniform legislation bill. <laughs> Sorry. No, I know. It's... Uh, Order, I, order, I second reading that speech. This bill is not a uniform legislation um, bill. Part two of the bill gives. Uh, part two of the. Sorry, I'll just read it as is. I advise that this bill is a uniform legislation bill. Part two of the bill gives effect to an intergovernmental or multilateral agreement to which the government of the state is a party through the powers to implement arrangements with other jurisdictions relating uh, to the deemed registration of veterinarians in WA. 
I am confident this bill will significantly improve the regulation and the provision of veterinary services in the state. I commend the bill to the House and table the explanatory memorandum. Uh, order. Members, uh, uh, debate on the uh, uh, on that the, the question is adjourned, and uh, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on Uniform stands ad, uh, adjour, uh, referred to the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation. Sorry. Uh, and uh, the explanatory memorandum is tabled. That uh, concludes bills for introduction. Um, orders of the day. All oh, right. All right. Uh, I mean, continue with orders of the day is what I mean. Uh, members, we now continue with orders of the day. Uh, the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. Um, the Minister for Environment. Thank you. So we're dealing with the consideration of report, Mr Deputy President. So I move that the report be adopted. Uh, members. Uh, members, I have received from the Chairman of Committee. Uh, members, question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister for Environment. Thanks, Mr. Deputy President. I move that the order, that, sorry, I move that the third reading of the bill be made an order of the day for the next sitting of the House. The question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, order of the day number 12: the Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment, Change of Name Bill 2018. Uh, the continuation, uh, sorry, the my reply. Continuation. The continuation of the uh, second reading. The question of the bill will be read a second time. Uh, the leader of the house in reply. Uh, thank you very much. So I had uh, nearly finished my uh, reply, and I was uh, addressing some of the issues that have been raised by the honourable uh, Nick Goyran. So he had. Um, questioned whether or not uh, the bill uh, created a class structure uh, in WA, uh, and the response to that is no. The provisions of the bill will be applied equally across all change of name applicants. With the exclusion of those who are restricted persons, every application for a change of name will be uh, based on the applicant meeting the requirements. Um, he also raised the issue of uh, engagement with the documentation, uh, document verification service by the Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages. So the registry engages extensively with the document verification service. The service is a Commonwealth initiative within the National uh, Identity Security Strategy. This is an online service that is used to authenticate identity credentials, such as birth certificates, motor drivers' licences, Medicare cards, passports and the like that are presented by individuals when used in conjunction with proving identity. The registry uses the verification service daily to authenticate evidence of identity credentials provided to it for the purpose of changing a name or seeking access to life uh, event information certificates within the West Australian Register. This amendment will serve to strengthen the ability of the registrar to continue to participate in name-based identity checks using the document verification service and also its role as an issuer of identity-based documents such as, such as change of name certificates. Um, the honourable member raised the issue, I think, uh, finally about uh, the um, policy decision to only allow uh, three changes of name within a lifetime. So consistent with other jurisdictions and or um, SCAG and COAG agreements, um, the bill limits a person changing their name once in a 12-month period and up to a maximum of three times in a lifetime. The registrar uh, can exercise discretion 
when a person wishes to take their spouse's name or if a change of name is necessary following a divorce. The discretion, for example, also extends, but it is not limited to, people who are experiencing domestic violence or other persons who have been protected by the state. The registrar may also approve a change of name more than once in 12 months or more than three changes in a lifetime, or when a person may have been born outside Western Australia, if the registrar is satisfied that there are sufficient good circumstances uh, to warrant that registration. Section uh, 67 of the Act also provides that a person who is dissatisfied um, with a decision of the registrar may apply to the State Administrative Tribunal for a review of the decision. Um, now, I have a table here um, so, which provides information which uh, the honourable member may have sought. Uh, in his um, second reading speech, uh, but it basically refers to the other jurisdictions. So if I can run through that. Uh, in the ACT, there's no set number in a lifetime, only one in a 12-month period, and that's in operational policy. In the Northern Territory, no set number in a lifetime, only one in a 12-month in period, and that's in operational policy. New South Wales, three changes of name in a lifetime and only one in a 12-month period, and that's in legislation. Queensland, no set number in a lifetime, <clears throat> only one in 12-month period, that's in legislation. South Australia, three changes of name in a lifetime and only one in a 12-month period, that's in operational policy. Tasmania and Victoria are the same. So that is three changes of name in a lifetime, only one in a 12-month period, and both of those are also uh, set out in operational uh, policy. I trust that I have canvassed all of the issues that uh, members raised, uh, and I commend the bill to the House. Uh, members, the question is the bill be read. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Births, deaths and marriages registration amendment, change of name bill 2018, second reading. And we will consider this, this uh, bill and its supplementary notice paper now in committee. Honourable members, we are dealing with the births, deaths and marriages registration amendment change of name bill 2018. Uh, we are, have a supplementary notice paper available. It is notice paper number 87. Uh, and we are up to issue number three. Members, the question before the House shall therefore be that clause one stand as printed. We call the Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Mr <coughs> Deputy uh, Chair. Minister, does this bill require a person born in Australia to apply for any change of name in their birth state? The Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yes, I'm advised, yes. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Uh, Minister, now the explanatory memorandum says, and I quote, this will allow for greater transparency as each and every change of a name will be formally linked to the applicant's birth registration, end quote. What have been the problems with the existing system that this greater transparency will cure?
The Minister. Mr. Chair, so I'm advised that uh, trying to get uh, to deal with the problem where uh, a person can move uh, between states, use the respective provisions within uh, those states or territories, um, and that information hasn't necessarily been shared and indeed hasn't uh, been recorded. So um, the way that the system um, will work, I'm advised under this regime, is that information on the back of the birth certificate, for example, will be recorded. Um, up until now, I'm advised, that has not been possible and systems haven't necessarily been linked. The Honourable Nick Garrard. Uh, now, Minister, until this bill comes into operation, can a person that's born outside of Western Australia still apply for a change of name in Western Australia? Minister. Thanks. Yes, I'm advised yes. The Honourable Nick Garrard. And Minister, does this bill restrict people born overseas from changing their name unless they are an Australian citizen or a permanent resident? Minister. Chair, the default position is yes, although it's important to note that the registrar does have discretion um, in certain circumstances. I don't know if you want me to go into those, but I'd have to seek other advice. The Honourable Nick Garrard. Uh, perhaps before we do that, uh, Minister, uh, I just want to then go to the response that you provided to the second reading speech. And this was in regards to the comment that I'd made uh, more than a year ago when I gave my second reading speech, uh, talking about different uh, categories or levels of individuals and my um, preliminary concern that the effect of this bill will be to give uh, different Australians and different Western Australians different change of name rights. So, for example, if you're a person who is born in Western Australia, uh, of which I'm not one of those people, uh, then you will have what I would describe as uh, a gold status of change of name rights. And I compare and contrast that to somebody who is born overseas, again, a, a, a category of person to which uh, I do not qualify, a person born overseas who is an Australian citizen or permanent resident, who I would describe as having a silver status under this regime. And compare and contrast that to those of us who are born interstate, who would then have what I would describe as a bronze uh, status. Now, of course, then you've got a fourth category of person, uh, which are various offenders. So I'm pleased to see that at least I'm uh, categorised higher than uh, various offenders. But uh, for reasons that are not apparent to me, Minister, a person like myself, who's been born interstate, in my case in New South Wales, for a grand total of a grand total of six weeks I resided in Western, in New South Wales until my family, well, until my family moved to Order Western members. Australia, at which point I've resided in Western Australia for the rest of my uh, life. Uh, I am uh, afforded under this bill less rights, less change of names rights than somebody who's born overseas. Um, and I find that curious and uh, would seek from you, Minister, an explanation as to why we would have these different change of name rights for Western Australian residents.
The Minister. Uh, Honourable Member, while the advisers are trying to find the document that I want them to refer to, uh, I am advised it was a recommendation out of the report into the Lint siege, and that while you're quite right in that, if you like, there's a cascading um, privilege, if I use the, what I think you would, the point you were trying to make, um, the, um, I'm advised that the report of the Lint siege recommended that each of the states do this as a mechanism uh, to try and bridge those gaps that existed. Now, of course, you're not precluded from applying to change your name. Um, you just need to do it uh, in, a, in the default position. You need to do it uh, in another state. I'm just trying to see if I can find the actual recommendation for you, honourable member. That might take us a minute. So while they're looking for that, if you wanted to continue your line of questioning. Uh, thank you, um, Minister. Now, you did mention that um, there would be some discretion that applied with respect to uh, persons born overseas. As I've mentioned, those of us uh, who were born interstate um, have a lesser, to use your <coughs> um, language, um, privilege under the cascading system than a person who is born overseas. You've indicated earlier that this bill will restrict uh, a person who's born overseas from changing their name unless they are an Australian citizen or a permanent resident, but that there is some discretion with the registrar. Uh, is there a document that sets out the criteria upon which that discretion will be exercised? The Minister. Oh, no. The Minister. Um, so, honourable member, I'm advised there is no document. I asked whether there was operational guidelines or anything like that. I'm advised that there isn't, uh, but I am advised that um, if the registrar um, uh, was in a position where it, he or she was asked to exercise that discretion. Um, it would not be unusual for them to ask for supporting information, uh, for, perhaps from police, perhaps from uh, domestic violence um, service providers uh, and the like. And I'm also uh, advised that um, that decision is reviewable uh, by SAT. But to the, to the point of your question about is there a set of guidelines or a policy document, I'm advised no, there isn't. The Honourable Nick Grant. And, Minister, this uh, notion of the registrar having discretion to allow a person who's been born overseas to change their name, even though they're not an Australian citizen or a permanent res resident, is that something that uh, comes out of the recommendations from the Lint Siege report? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm advised no, there was not a specific recommendation, but to the extent that uh, one of the things that the Lint Siege Report did do was effectively do a kind of overarching recommendation, states you need to close the gaps between your practices 
uh, and I'm advised that that was the practice that's adopted in several other jurisdictions. So WA took that on. It wasn't a precise and specific recommendation of the report, um, but to the extent that WA took on board what the report said, which was close the gaps, look around and see how you can kind of standardise, if you like, um, that was the position that WA took. Honourable Nick Duran. So in that respect, um, Minister, how does uh, uh, this bill change the arrangement for those who are born overseas? What's, what is the gap that we will be plugging as a result of this bill for uh, those born overseas? Mr uh, Deputy Chairman, uh, through you to the Minister, um, any person who is born overseas at the moment, uh, perhaps the best way to answer the question is, um, what capacity does a person who is born overseas currently have to change their name in Western Australia and what will it look like moving forward? Well, we understand that moving forward it will be that, unless you're an Australian citizen or permanent resident, you can't do it unless you obtain the discretion of the registrar, but what is it at the moment? Minister. Thanks, Chair. So I'm advised the difference is one is policy. So right now it's the same provisions, but they apply by way of policy. Um, and what happens as a result of uh, if the, this bill is passed is that that policy will be implemented by way of statute. The Honourable Nick Garan. And uh, Minister, does that then include this notion of discretion? Uh, for the registrar, for those people who are born overseas uh, who are not Australian citizens and not a permanent resident? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Yes, so the, that discretion is encompassed uh, in the statute. The Honourable Nick Garan. Now, Minister, you mentioned that the uh, notion of the cascading uh, privilege uh, it comes out of a recommendation from the Lint Siege report and uh, your advisers were just looking to see what the recommendation was. Is that now available? Minister. Okay. It was a recommendation out of a report, but it was not the Lint Siege um, report, so it was one of the ones that I think I refer to in my, um, I think I refer to this one in my second reading reply, which is the Standing Council on Law and Justice Working Group. Um, so was that, is that a um, subcommittee of SCAG or is it, is it officers or? Okay, so that I'm advised that that's a um, standing committee of the officers of the respective jurisdictions and that standing committee responds well, I don't think SCAG exists anymore. Uh, it responded to SCAG. It was 2011. It was recommendation five. If a person was born in Australia, they must apply for a change of name in the jurisdiction in which their birth is registered. The Honourable Nick Duran. Now, Minister, also in your second reading reply, you, you did make mention of uh, uh, those uh, national uh, uh, forums and uh, committees. Um, does that mean that uh, this in any way is a uh, uniform piece of legislation that uh, ought to have been considered uh, by the Standing Committee? The Minister. Um, timely, but no. The Honourable Nick Durant. Now, um, Minister, um, in your second reading reply you also referred to the 
my words, state of affairs in the other jurisdictions, and you referred to a document, maybe a table that sets out the uh, certain parameters. Is that uh, able to be tabled at this time? Minister, I'll ask you to unfortunately stand and tell us what you're doing. So I can table uh, this table, which, if I describe it, sets out the jurisdictions, the arrangements in place in respect to the number of applications for a change of name um, provided in that jurisdiction. And then the third column is whether or not it's applied by operational policy or legislation. That paper is tabled. <coughs> The Honourable Nick Duran. Thanks, Mr Deputy Chairman. If uh, copies of that could be made available to members that may assist some of the future questions. In the meantime, uh, Minister, is it the case that the bill will allow the registry of births, deaths and marriages to fully participate in the National Document Verification Service? And if so, which clauses of the bill will directly facilitate this full participation? Minister. Uh, Chair, so thanks. Um, so right now, we do, um, as an issuing agency, we do participate in the verification process, but we're advised that because it's not set out in our statute that we take a certain protections in respect to privacy, that what we're doing by policy, um, we're doing by policy, but uh, by <coughs> amending the provisions um, in the Act, through clause 14 of the bill, which amends section 54, we will ensure that we are um, appropriately participating in the document verification service um, and doing all the appropriate things in respect to um, protection of, uh, of privacy. The Honourable Nick Duran. So do I understand by that, uh, Minister, that in part, if a jurisdiction is uh, operating 
under the operational policy mode rather than the uh, statutory legislative mode, um, that they cannot then fully participate in the National Document Verification Service? Minister. Yeah. So, Chair, I'm advised that there are certain limitations that may be placed on them if they're using this service as part of their operational uh, policy um, because they may not be, by statute, taking all of the actions they need to take in respect to the information that is kind of inputted and then um, uh, outputted, if you like, to use a very inelegant um, expression. Um, so, um, yeah, to the extent that we don't, I'm not in a position to advise you on what other arrangements they have in place to, to address that, that the advice that we have is that in order to fully participate, um, we need to have ticked all of these boxes. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. So, Minister, um, are any of the Australian jurisdictions at the moment fully participating in the National Document Verification Service, or will we be the first uh, as a result of this? Minister. Chair, I'm advised others are, states and the Commonwealth. The Honourable Nick Garan. And are the other two states that are participating New South Wales or Queen and Queensland? So I'm advised I can't really um, tell you um, specifically which other uh, jurisdictions are participating fully, um, and I think it's, uh, I'm also advised it's worth bearing in mind other agencies within the states other than the birth, deaths and marriages registry, so various other documents, uh, various other agencies and security agencies, I'm advised through uh, the Commonwealth, rely on it. Uh, but I'm not sure that I'm uh, in a position to give you much more information about who is 100 per cent fully participating and who is uh, participating to a lesser extent. We, just, we don't have that information here. The Honourable Nick Garan. And so, Minister, this bill will allow Western Australia's registry of birth, deaths and marriages to fully participate in the National Document Verification Service. Is there any other agency in Western Australia that currently fully participates in this service? Minister. Right. Um, Chair, I'm not in a position to advise you of that. If it was of particular interest to the honourable member, I don't mind taking that on notice, but the, the advisers that are here don't have that information. The honourable Nick Durant. Oh, fair enough, Minister. Um, uh, perhaps uh, is it available at this time uh, to indicate whether there is any agency in Western Australia that, that participates, even if we might not know necessarily the specific name? The Minister. I can give you, Honourable Member, is that um, we think there was an agency which did a pilot, but I can't tell you any more than that. That's fine. The Honourable Nick Graham. Now, uh, Minister, this uh, table that you tabled earlier today uh, is useful and uh, obviates the need for me to ask uh, some of the questions that I had. Um, if I can take you, for example, to the New South Wales, the New South Wales uh, model, which is of course of particular interest to me, albeit I should hasten to add, uh, Leader of the House, that uh, I actually have no interest in changing my name, but nevertheless, I'm just using it as a practical example. No. <laughs> Um, now, New South Wales, it indicates there that under legislation a person has a lifetime maximum of three changes of name and only one in a 12-month period. Now, as we indicated earlier, if a person 
was born in New South Wales but now resides in Western Australia. Once this bill passes, they will not be able to apply for a change of name in Western Australia. They will have to go to New South Wales and apply there. Now, of course, that means that they will be limited to three changes of name in a lifetime and, as I say, only one in a 12-month period. Um, is the government at all concerned about that, particularly when one gives consideration to issues of family and domestic violence and circumstances where it may well be the case that a Western Australian resident um, may be the victim of family and domestic violence? There may be a need, as a matter of safety, for them to have to change their name, but they are prohibited under this regime because they've already obtained the maximum under the New South Wales uh, regime. Is that a point of concern for the government and to what extent can that concern uh, be addressed? The Minister. So thank you, Chief. So what's contained in the bill before us is the provisions that say, allow um, discretion by the registrar um, to satisfy themselves that there are particular reasons, and domestic violence is often used as an example, um, to go beyond and to allow the person to apply for uh, a change here. Um, and I think I did refer to that in my second reading um, reply. Um, so yeah, what I said was a registrar can exercise discretion. Um, the discretion, for example, also extends, but is not limited, to people who are experiencing domestic violence or other persons who are being protected by the state. The registrar uh, may also approve a name, a change of name more than once within 12 months or more than three changes in a lifetime or when a person may have been born outside Western Australia if the registrar is satisfied there are sufficient good circumstances to warrant that registration. And I talked about the kind of information they might rely on, supporting information from police or domestic violence services, for example, if they were exercising that discretion. The Honourable Nick Durant. So, Minister, are you indicating that that discretion of the Western Australian registrar still exists even for a person, even for a person who has been born interstate? Minister. Chair, yes, because the change of name would be done here and not in New South Wales. The Honourable Nick Durant. Okay. And, um, uh, but in the absence of an interstate person applying to the Western Australian Registrar to utilise their discretion, <coughs> they will otherwise have to apply in their relevant state. Yeah. Minister? Yes, that's correct. Right. The Honourable Nick Durant. And, uh, Minister, the final theme under Clause 1 uh, from me uh, relates to the fact that various clauses in this bill give the authority to the registrar to do or determine certain things. Now, sometimes these things are mandatory under the bill and at other times they are discretionary. Uh, my two-part question is, what remedy is available if a mandatory thing is not done? And my second question is, what remedy is available if the registrar misapplies his or her discretion? Minister. The provisions exist now uh, for those um, remedies, uh, well, decisions to be reviewed by SAT. So whether that is a decision 
in favour or a decision against either one uh, can be reviewed by SAT. If you were asking the question in terms of remedy about um, you know, compensation or whatever, that, that's not anticipated, but the, the decisions are certainly reviewable by SAT now and will be, that's continued under the bill before us. Question is clause one, standards printed. The Honourable Michael Mission, no. Clause one. Question is that clause one, standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. Members, the question is that clause two, standards printed. The Honourable Nick Duran. Uh, th thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, now, Minister, you'll see that there is an amendment standing in my name on the supplementary notice paper, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, but before we do that, um, I note that there is a desirability for the operative provisions in this bill to commence via proclamation. Um, is that desirability because of the need to first prepare the form that is referred to in new section 30, subsection 2, and 31, subsection 5? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. So uh, the reasons that we want provisions to be proclaimed as soon as uh, practical following assent is that amendments will be required to the births, deaths and marriages registration regs to prescribe public authorities who may be informed of changes of name. Uh, that's pursuant to proposed section 35B of the bill. And then secondly, and this is um, uh, goes to, I think, what you were asking about, um, the Department of Justice is uh, updating IT systems to provide a limited interface between the WA registry system and Corrective Services Total Offender Management System, which is referred to as TOMS, and the Community Business Information System, which is CBIS. Um, so those two reasons go to the timing. So, Minister, just with respect to the form that's referred to in new section 30, subsection 2, and uh, 31 subsection 5, is that a form that will be uh, prepared as part of the regulation drafting process that you referred to? Minister. I'm advised it's an approved form, not a, it's not, it doesn't require regulations to be created. Now, um, Minister, what is the expected time frame? And I want to take you to three parts here. What is the expected time frame for the preparation of the regulations that you've referred to? What's the expected time frame for the pre preparation of the approved form that you've referred to? And what is the expected time frame for this IT systems upgrade that you've referred to? Minister. Okay. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. So in respect to the regulations, I'm advised that there's a pesky little thing, uh, like a state election, uh, that might get in the way of those, but it's anticipated uh, within three to six months. That's a longer than normal period because uh, of, the, uh, of the election. The forms won't take any, um, you know, any really additional time. And it Yes, I could. Uh, and the IT within three months. The Honourable Nick Durant. Now, Minister, I find this uh, quite interesting because uh, members will, be, will recall that the last time that the government prioritised this bill, as I recall at least, is September of last year. Now we find out that uh, these provisions uh, will all become operative quite apart from the fact that the other place is going to have to sit to deal with these amendments. Um, but let's assume for a moment that the government's serious about prioritising this matter and recall the other place to deal with the amendments. Let's assume that that happens. In essence, everything will be up and running within the next six months, with the only possible delay caused by virtue of the state election. Now, Mr Deputy Chairman, had this all been dealt with last September, when the matter was last before us, that means that this whole regime would be up and running. That means that all of the various things that the government have said are important, including, I quote from the explanatory memorandum, that this will allow for greater transparency, as each and every change of a name will be formally linked to the applicant's birth registration, that this will, all, this will all have already been up and running and in place. But unfortunately, most regrettably, uh, the government have decided to ensure that this particular bill has been buried, buried on the daily notice paper over the course of the last 14 months. And now we're in a situation where in the last scheduled sitting week of the Legislative Council in the 40th Parliament, we're seeking to address this important bill, which has the support of the opposition. Um, and now we find out today that uh, it's going to take another three to six months for these final matters to become operative. What a shame that these things weren't prioritised by the McGowan government in September of last year. Now, of course, of course, it has been the regular refrain of the McGowan government, Mr Deputy Chairman, to uh, blame all matters of delay on COVID-19. That's been the regular ref refrain over the course of 2020, and hence why I emphasise and underscore the point that this was last before us in September of last year. So COVID-19 has absolutely nothing to do with the delays with respect to this, this matter, and it's most regrettable uh, that the delays will be entirely the fault of the government. That said, Mr Acting President, uh, Mr Deputy Chairman, uh, we would like to facilitate the speedy passage of this much delayed bill and uh, without any further ado, I move the amendment standing in my name at clause 2 at 1 oblique 2. Honourable Members, the Honourable Nick Garan has moved, according to Supplementary Notice Paper 87, Issue No. 3, uh, at clause 2 at 1 oblique 2, that is page 2, lines 6 to 7, to delete the lines and insert a, sections 1 to 3, on the day on which this Act receives royal assent, semicolon, and the question before the House is the words to be deleted be deleted. The Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. So as I indicated in my second reading reply, the Government will not be opposing uh, the amendments on the supplementary notice paper in the name of the Honourable Nick Goran and in the name of the Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, the Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. It's uh, been drawn to my attention that if the Honourable Nick Garan's amendment is accepted and paragraph A of, of existing clause 2 is replaced, uh, that when we move to my amendment at serial 10 oblique 2, inserting the word royal assent after the word royal assent in brackets, um, quote, uh, assent day close brackets, it will be an amendment to an amendment accepted by the House. 
and that there is a procedural or technical difficulty entail, uh, resulting from that. And so to obviate that problem, what I would move without notice is that after the words royal assent in the Honourable Nick Garan's amendment, there be an amendment by inserting before the semicolon, brackets, assent day, close brackets. And then I can abandon my 10 oblique 2 and proceed on with ten, uh, 9 oblique 2. And uh, I have a... Yeah. Well, we have, uh, have you got a written version of it? I have a... OK, I have thank that. you. Right, honourable members, um, the Honourable Michael Mission has moved an amendment to the amendment on the notice paper of the Honourable Nick Iran, that is... Um, after the words the royal assent to insert the words in brackets assent day. Now members don't necessarily have a copy of this but if members are prepared to proceed whilst we get copies made because it's a fairly simple amendment I will put the amendment says the amendment to the amendment is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Are you minister? No, the question is the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed no. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, members, the uh, question before the House there, well, we still need to delete the lines of insert. Yeah. No? Or could we just do it as agreed? Yeah, OK. So we'll still need to delete. So the question before the House is that the words to be deleted be deleted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. The question is therefore that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. Members, the question before the House, is there any other on two? Oh, there is another one on two. So the question before the House is that clause two as amended be agreed to call the Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. And uh, now I proceed to uh, my second amendment. which appears in supplementary notice paper 87, issue number three, page two at serial nine, oblique two, to insert on page two of the bill after line nine, a new sub clause two, the effect of which is uh, as a matter of consistency and in accordance with uh, what's developing into an accepted practice is uh, the effect of sunset clause after 10 years noting that uh, the bill or elements of it can be proclaimed from time to time, that any, though, any of those that uh, are not proclaimed after a period of 10 years after royal assent will, uh, uh, will be repealed. And so I move the amendment standing in my name. Honourable Members, the Honourable Michael Mission has moved the Mission Amendment. Uh, that is um, Supplementary Notice Paper 87, Issue Number 3. At a 9 oblique 2, page 2 after line 9 to insert new part 2. However, A, if no day is fixed under subsection 1B before the end of the period of 10 years beginning on the assent day, this Act is repealed on the day after that period ends. Or B, if paragraph A does not apply and, the provision, and a provision of this Act does not come into operation before the end of the period of 10 years beginning on the assent day, that provision is repealed on the day after that period ends. The question before the House members is the words to be inserted be inserted. Minister. The question is the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. The question before the House is that clause two as amended be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Full of enthusiasm. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. The question before the House is therefore that clause three stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. That's better. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, the question would therefore be that clause four stand as printed. Leader of the House. Thank you, Chair. So this is that uh, I move the amendment standing in my name on the supplementary uh, notice paper. Uh, to delete the lines. Um, this is con a consequential amendment to align the births, deaths, marriages, registration amendment, change of name bill 20, 2018 uh, to the already assented to High Risk Offenders, Serious Offenders Act 2020. And for the benefit of the House, the next six amendments in my name are uh, giving um, 
effect to the exactly the same thing. Okay. Do one at a time. Okay. All right. So members, uh, the leader of the house has moved uh, as per supplementary notice paper uh, on uh, at four. Uh, sorry. Two oblique. Four. That's right. Two oblique four. Uh, page two, lines twenty-two to twenty-four. Delete the lines. Those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. Um, Minister, we're going to we're gonna have to get you to move. Just stand up and move, and I'll read them. I move the uh, amendment standing in my name at three oblique four. Uh, the minister has moved for the supplementary notice paper 87, issue number three, at three oblique four. Uh, that is page two, after line 28, to insert a new section. High risk serious offender means a person subject to A, a supervision order as defined in the High Risk Serious Offenders Act 2020, section 27.1, or B, an order under the High Risk Serious Offenders Act 2020, section 58. The question is the words to be inserted be inserted. The Honourable Michael Mission. Chair, just one question, and uh, perhaps the Minister can confirm for the, the uh, satisfaction of the House that by replacing the reference from dangerous sexual offender, meaning someone under a, a subject to a supervision order as defined in the Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act 2006, section 3, subsection 1, and replacing it with a new definition with reference to the High Risk Serious Offenders Act, um, any dangerous sexual offender that is that was or is subject to a supervision order under the Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act will also be captured by this fresh definition, that there will not be a hiatus, as it were, that those who had orders against them under that other legislation, which is now being repealed, That's right. will uh, not escape the operation of what is proposed here. The Minister. Covered. So all of those captured previously are now captured uh, under the new provisions, so there is no um, gap, if you like. The question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. Leader of the House. I move the amendment on the supplementary notice paper standing in my name at four oblique four. Members, the minister has moved according to supplementary notice paper 87, issue number three, uh, at four oblique four, that is page three, line 11, to delete the words this dangerous sexual and insert high risk serious. The question is the words to be deleted be deleted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. The question is the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. The question, therefore, is that clause four as amended be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. Does any member have a clause to debate the clause before clause 14? Oh, sorry, 13? Six. The question shall be, therefore, that clause five stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. The question is the clause six standards printed. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Minister, what are the exceptional circumstances envisioned in proposed new section 29 capital A subsection 1C? Chair, so I'm advised um, some of these we've already touched on in an earlier debate. There isn't a prescribed list, but the sorts of things envisaged are those people who are um, uh, impacted by domestic violence, those people in the witness protection program, those people who may have, for example, a mental illness and there is um, supporting advice from a practitioner that um, it's in their interests uh, to change their name. These um, exceptional um, 
uh, or exercises of the exceptional um, kind of provisions discretion happens now, and those are the kind of examples that I've been given. The Honourable Nick Garan. And uh, Minister, with regard to uh, the, their three helpful examples that you've given, and as you've indicated, I uh, think earlier that the registrar won't be necessarily gu guided by any written uh, policy or, or written criteria. Um, when we look at those three examples you've given, witness protection, mental illness, domestic violence, uh, it's reasonably um, appreciable what evidence might be needed to demonstrate the witness protection example and indeed the mental illness example. I think you may have even mentioned the possibility of a, of a medical report. Um, with respect to domestic violence, what would be the type of evidence that would need to be provided to the registrar to, d to satisfy that a change of name is indeed needed for the personal protection of the person? You've indicated that uh, it really all we are doing here is enshrining in statute the existing process, so perhaps you could indicate what type of evidence is currently considered to be satisfactory. The Minister. Thanks, Chair. So I did flag um, this partly in answer to a question a little bit earlier, but the supporting material may be from police. This will be depending on, depending on the circumstances, obviously. So maybe uh, supporting information provided by the police, uh, supporting in, so there might be a VRO in place or, or, or something like that. Um, supporting information provided by uh, perhaps a domestic violence service provider, uh, perhaps a medical practitioner. Um, there's a range of circumstances um, and a range of, um, depending on the particular circumstances, uh, of supporting material that the registrar would request to assist them help make their decision. The Honourable Nick Garan. And Minister, is it um, routinely, uh, or perhaps not necessarily routinely, is it, is it uh, does the registrar permit um, evidence to be provided uh, in a piecemeal fashion. So, for example, you can well imagine a, a victim of domestic violence perhaps uh, endeavouring to obtain this discretion from the registrar, maybe not necessarily having all of their paperwork in order, maybe not necessarily providing um, information uh, at first instance to a standard that the registrar considers satisfactory. Um, is, it routine, is it the case that then the registrar simply dismisses the application the person has to start again, or is there some kind of transitional arrangement that would allow the person to come back with further evidence? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so I'm advised that the, uh, there's an application process and that there are officers of the registry who will assist applicants in preparing them the material and advising them of what they need. I'm also advised that the average turnaround of an application is 15 days, um, but the, uh, there is capacity, and they have, in particularly um, urgent cases, fast-tracked that application. And, and done it quicker, and it can take a little bit longer if more information is required. Members, the question is that for six standards printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair and the Minister. Just in respect of these categories where um, the registrar can grant an exception to the rule, personal protection of the person change because of marriage or divorce or otherwise justified by exceptional circumstances. Uh, when we first started debating this bill, 
um, I think it was second read on the here on the 5th of December 2018, and at that stage I think we were told that there was something like 42,000 changes of name across Australia and something in the order of 10% of those were changes in Western Australia. That's a couple of years ago now. Uh, are you able to give us an idea of how many changes would be given exceptions because of this uh, under each of these categories. So we get a flavour of uh, how unusual granting exceptions may be. Minister. So I'm advised no, the data is actually not, um, not collected, uh, honourable member. So right now they do this by way of policy. It's anticipated that once it's in the statute, it is something that they would uh, collect that data on. They may even uh, uh, report on it. But um, so no, I, I can't give you um, a sort of breakdown of category by category. I'm advised that there is a particular um, uh, kind of exceptional circumstances that, that has been used um, from time to time um, about um, uh, restricting access to information about the change of name and that that's been used maybe two or three times a month. That's, but that's a pretty um, rough um, estimate. Um, but, I mean, part of the one of the benefits of moving this into the statute is that that data will be collected. So Honourable Michael Wishing. Oh, thank you. OK. Oh, sorry. I do apologise. Sorry. The Honourable Michael Wishing. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. The, the, OK, so you're not able to give even... Um, or you're, you don't have any information as to roughly how many changes are for personal protection or for, as a result of marriage or divorce, let alone exceptional circumstances. But exceptional circumstances a couple of times a month or at least one category of exceptional circumstance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Members, the question is that clause six standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, members, could you please indicate um, the next clause you'd like to speak to, if there's a clause before clause 13? Seven. Uh, question is that clause seven standards printed. The Honourable Nick Garone. Th thank you, Madam Deputy Chairman. Uh, Minister, you kindly provided earlier by way of uh, the discussion under Clause 1 a table setting out some of the information with respect to the other jurisdictions in our nation. Now that table does usefully set out some of the restrictions, uh, for example as discussed earlier in uh, New South Wales under their legislative regime uh, uh, three changes of name are permitted in a lifetime and only one in a 12-month period. And that is the same as South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria, albeit that those three jurisdictions operate under an operational policy uh, mode rather than a statutory mode. Now, my question, uh, Minister, is if we look at Clause 7 before us, you'll see that there is certain criteria set out at proposed section 30, subsection 1. And my question is, is there a, a table, or can you advise the House, uh, which of the other jurisdictions apply that same criteria that we see there set out at proposed section 30?
Minister. Thanks, Madam Chair. So in respect to the change of name for adults uh, or children being in the birth state only, um, it does not exist. Uh, yeah, but what's that telling me? So it says, is this currently a legislative requirement? No, legislative. Okay. Uh, so no in the ACT. Um, no in the uh, in the territory. Um, this is I find this quite difficult to read actually. Honourable Member, I can probably get you an extract out of this, um, but I, I'm not going to be able to get it for you now. Um, but I think we could, um, if it assists, if, you know, if it's a matter of some ongoing interest, I can under, give you an undertaking to provide you with this information. But it is quite hard to pull for me to pull it out uh, now. All right. Um, well, Minister, perhaps can you just indicate, maybe rather than those jurisdictions that don't do the same thing as what we do in terms of this eligibility criteria, is there a jurisdiction that does do the same thing that we are modelling ourselves on? Okay. Thanks, Chair. So I'm, I'm sorry this is a bit clunky. New South Wales, yes. Uh, Queensland, there's a sort of variation to it. So it, it, there is a legislative requirement that an adult or child must either have the birth or adoption registered in Queensland um, or be born overseas and ordinarily reside in Queensland. South Australia, yes, it's in their legislation. And Victoria, yes, it's in their legislation. The Honourable Nick now, Minister, you say that um, South Australia and Victoria, it's in their legislation. But the document that was tabled a little bit earlier says South Australia and Victoria are operating under an operational policy model, not under a legislation model. Can we just clarify which model South Australia and Victoria are operating under? So, the Minister. Chair, uh, thank you, Chair. So, the table that you're referring to is a table of one specific provision, which is around how many times can you make application. Right. Members, the question is that clause seven standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Can members indicate if you'd like to speak to any um, clause before clause 13? Uh, members, the question is that clause eight standards printed. The Honourable Nick Garan. Minister, what was the feedback from the Commissioner for Children and Young People about the provisions which would enable a child's name to be changed without their consent? Thank you. I'm advised no feedback was received because no feedback was sought. Honourable Nick Garan. could uh, almost insert the name of the Chief Health Officer here. We can't expect them to provide information if we don't ask it from them in the first place. Now, I just find it a bit odd, Madam Deputy Chair, that the McGowan government would be bringing a piece of legislation before us which would enable children's names to be changed without their consent. And we don't even ask the Commissioner for Children and Young People for an opinion. Uh, I'd understood 
certainly having served on the committee, the oversight committee for the Commissioner for Children and Young People, that one of the purposes of having the Commissioner was for the Commissioner to be able to provide insight uh, on legislation, particularly legislation impacting children. Here we have a situation where children's names can be changed without their consent. Now, yes, I'll be pleased to. Um, so the current legislation allows for application to register the change of a child's name up until age 12. So to that extent, it's no different. It's no different. It's no different but we still haven't asked the Commissioner for Children and Young People about an opinion on that. Nevertheless, uh, Minister, I note that under Clause 8, proposed section 31, subsection 3, it would enable a child's guardian to make a change of name application if the parents cannot be found. Who will determine whether this is the case that the, the parents can be found and what evidence would be needed for example, would a missing persons report at least need to be made to West Australian Police? So um, this is straight out of the existing provisions, and I'm advised that they would require uh, a formal guardianship uh, arrangement um, from SAT um, as a, as, uh, or the Children's Court um, or the Family Court. Um, that, that's, the, that's the policy. That's the arrangements that they use now. The Honourable Nick Garan. Yes, Minister, but you, you, it may well be the case that there is a formal SAT guardianship process in place, but the parents can be found. And um, it's, as I understand proposed section 31.3, it's intended to only apply, only apply if the parents cannot uh, be found. Uh, that's my understanding. Perhaps it's, but perhaps it's incorrect. Is it, is it intended that a child's guardian will simply be able to make a change of name ap application for a child, irrespective of whether the children's parents can be found or not. So I'm advised it would depend on what the particular orders were applying to that child and whether there were any restrictions around what could be done in respect of the child's name uh, included in those orders. But in the absence of any orders, uh, I'm advised that uh, the uh, registrar would require the parents' um, approval. Would? Is that correct? Okay, sorry. Apply, not approve. So, so I'm advised, just, just so we get this absolutely clear, in the absence of any order about that child, which says, as part of that order, you cannot change the child's name, in the absence of any order to that effect, the only way that uh, this child's name can be changed is if an application is made by a parent. Both parents, if they're named. The Nick uh, I confess, Minister, to be a little bit confused about that, um, because when I look at the relevant clause, uh, we're still under clause 8 here, proposed section 31.3 says an application under subsection 1 or 2 may be made by a child's guardian only if. So this is uh, a provision which is restricting the circumstances in which a child's guardian can make an application. And it says only if the parents of the child are dead. Okay, so one can easily imagine that what is then needed to be provided 
is a death certificate or some other proof that the child's parents are no longer alive. Secondly, cannot be found, and that was what my question was pertaining to, there would need to be some evidence to demonstrate that the children's parents cannot be found. And hence why I was asking about whether a missing persons report with the West Australian Police would as a minimum need to have been filed. And then thirdly, or for some other reason, cannot exercise their parental responsibilities for the child. And I'm gonna to get to that third uh, scenario uh, in a minute. But I just wanna go back to, to the second of the three circumstances in which a child's guardian can make a change of name application. It seems to me that if you're a guardian for a child, you simply can't make an application if the parents child uh, the, if the parents of the child are alive, they can be found and they can exercise their parental responsibilities. You can't do that and that was the in a, sense, in a sense, the response that you provided earlier, indicating that uh, that would need to be made by the parents. But if it is the case that they cannot be found, uh, I take it that the registrar will need to be satisfied that these parents uh, cannot be found. Um, I think you've indicated earlier that, once again, we're just enshrining the current uh, process. What is the evidence that the registrar currently accepts from a child's guardian as to whether the parents of the child uh, can be found or not. The Minister. Thanks, Jen. So um, the advice at the table is that nobody can recall any such application. <laughs> However, uh, I'm advised that if that was to happen, it is most, like, most likely, based on the current practice, is that the registrar would say to the person seeking to make the application, you need to get an order uh, from a relevant court that demonstrates that, that you are in a position to make that application. But I am, this is hypothetical because the advisers cannot recall such an application. The Honourable Nick Gurran. Fair enough, Minister. And uh, I mean, I mean, at least uh, I'm uh, uh, pleased to hear that there would be some additional check and balance in the sense of making the child's guardian go and obtain a specific order, in effect, permitting them to do this. And one would assume uh, that the relevant uh, officer at uh, SAT would want to be satisfied that the parents are not able to be found and the like. Now, that said, does that also apply with respect to the third category? That is, that a child's parents cannot exercise their parental responsibilities. This seems to be um, quite an unusual provision because I can imagine a circumstance where the parents can exercise their parental responsibilities but refuse to do so. Would that then mean that the a guardian would be unable to change to apply for the change of name of the the child. Uh, what type of evidence would need to be provided in that instance? Are we talking about a report from child child protection or something else that might satisfy the access via this gateway? Thanks, Chair. So I'm advised that, uh, again, this is not, not an application that uh, the officer at the table um, has experienced. But in the first instance, um, the view would be that um, unable to, cannot exercise their parental responsibilities would be deemed to be because there was some legal inability to do that. That is that there was, the child was in the care of the CEO of the Department of Child Protection or whatever. Um, but if it was the case that it was um, a mental health issue or, or a health issue, then it would be around medical records. The 
And, Minister, my final question under Clause uh, 8 pertains to proposed section 31, subsection 2D1. This prohibits an application being made in the first year of a child's life unless at least one of their parents or guardians has lived in Western Australia for at least a year. Since the bill doesn't amend section 23, will this section 31 restriction fall away if the application is limited to changing the child's given names? The Minister. Chair, I'm advised yes, so 23 would still apply. Uh, members, noting the time, I'm required to leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. Honourable members, the President. Are there any questions today? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Madam President. My question about notes that some is given is the Leader of the House representing the Premier at C1339. I refer to your response to question without notice 1158 asked on October 22, 2020, and ask one Was the Lottery West Board decision on the rejection of the grant proposal by Margaret Court Community Outreach operating through my, uh, Victory Life Services unanimous? Two, will you table the minutes of the board meeting which made the decision of the application with appropriately redacted details? And if not, one. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one yes, two yes, I table the attached. Oh, thank you. That document is tabled, Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam President, for that estimate, so you wouldn't have to worry. Um, my question without notice, which not, some notice is given, is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to the radio advertisement on control borders currently being played on radio, where the Premier provides a voiceover and asks, one, how much money has been spent uh, to date on these radio ads, two, what is the total cost of the radio ad campaign, and three, for how long will this radio ad campaign run? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to three, I'm assuming the honourable member is referring to the radio spots that inform West Australians of the latest health advice and changes with regards to travel into Western Australia. The total cost of the radio spots will be $117,193. Spend to date is $52,414. They're running for four weeks in total. This includes four weeks on regional radio and three weeks on metropolitan stations and Aboriginal radio. The State Government continues to ensure important COVID-19 advice and public information is made available to West Australians across a range of channels and platforms and reflects the latest health advice. I note this is in keeping with the request from the now Opposition Leader, the Member for Dawesville's correspondence dated 1 March 2020, to the Minister for Health in which he wrote, there is no doubt that a high-profile public information and advertising campaign activated across all media outlets and mediums will have a beneficial impact and may go some way to help protect us all should coronavirus reach Western Australia, I remain concerned that in the absence of any campaign, misinformation, unfounded fears and panic may result. I trust this public communication of the latest health advice is not being undermined by the Honourable Member, given the Leader of the Opposition's pledge yesterday to accept the health advice and his support for its high-profile communication. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President. I feel much more reassured having dear leader tell me over the radio. <laughs> Member, you might want to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Madam no, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some has been given, is directed to the Leader of the House representing the Attorney General. Given that the government has chosen to leave vacant since 28 April this year the position of Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission because it could not get its way in appointing its preferred candidate, one, to what extent has the lack of a full-time commissioner significantly disrupted or compromised operational activities? Two, provide evidence to support those assertions. Three, have you since April asked for or received any further reports from the Commission of ongoing or emerging investigations? And four, if so, when and for what purpose? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, the government has not chosen to leave this position vacant. The government continues to support the candidate, the honourable John McKechnie QC, put forward by the nominating committee that was chaired by the Chief Justice of Western Australia, and has order, order, order. The minister has been asked a question. The minister is trying to reply to the question. If you'd like to hear the answer, you'd let her continue. Thanks, Madam Chair, and has been blocked in its attempts to reappoint him. 
The Honourable Donna Farragher. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Call it that, um, Madam. That's the way they go. The Honourable Donna Farragher, thank would you like a question? I, I, I would, thank you. I know. Um, thank I you, you would. Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to pre-primary enrolment requirements and requests received on occasion by school principals from parents seeking some flexibility in the school starting age for their children, and I ask one, can the minister confirm that principals have the authority to make decisions regarding year group placements? Two, if yes to one, a, what matters are taken into consideration by principals in making such decisions where a request has been received for some flexibility, and b, are there any mechanisms by which parents can seek to appeal a decision of a principal, and if so, will the minister provide further detail? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One yes. Two a principals consider the parents' reasons for making the request, as well as other relevant information provided by health professionals, school psychologists, or educators who know the child. B principals are best placed to make these decisions in consultation with the family. In the event that parents are not satisfied by the outcome determined by the principal, they may request a review be undertaken by the local regional executive director. Uh, following that, a parent may request that the procedure by which the principal made the decision be reviewed by the Minister uh, for Education under Section 223 of the School Education Act. I might just add um, that goes to uh, the process. I can't make a review the, the merit or otherwise. Uh, the Minister is not obliged to conduct a review. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Commerce. I refer to the statutory reviews mandated under our state's laws, and I ask one, has a statutory review been conducted in accordance with section 13 of the Business Names Commonwealth Powers Act 2012? Two, has a statutory review been conducted in accordance with section 14 of the Petroleum Retailers' Rights and Liabilities Act 1982? Three, has a statutory review been conducted in accordance with section 33 of Gas Supply Gas Quality Specifications Act 2009? Four, further to one, two and three above, when did the reviews commence, when were they completed and when will the minister table the review reports? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the member for the question. The following information has been provided by the Minister for Commerce. One yes, two yes. Three, the Gas Supply Gas Quality Specifications Act 2009 is administered by Energy Policy of WA, which, of which the Minister for Energy is the responsible minister. As such, this part of the member's question should be referred to the minister representing the Minister for Energy. Four, the review of the Business Names Commonwealth Powers Act 2012 WA commenced in 2017. The final report from the review was tabled in Parliament on the 8th of May 2018. The review of the Petroleum Retailers' Rights and Liabilities Act 1982 WA was due to commence in 2005 but was deferred due to pending regulatory changes by the Commonwealth. The review has been undertaken during 2020 and a final report is currently being prepared. The Honourable Jackie Bordell. Madam President, uh, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre, AMHC in Newman, and the associated Papaginia Aboriginal Community Safety Project, and I ask one, have the Department of Communities received any requests for, had any discussions with or undertaken to provide funding for either the AMHC or the Papaginia Aboriginal Males Healing Centre to assist with running programs or housing? If yes, please detail. To to uh, please table any changes between the 2019, 20 and 2021 financial years to government funding for organisations focused on the prevention of family and domestic violence programs. And three, given the minister has previously stated her support for programs, working in partnership with Aboriginal communities and supporting local Aboriginal initiatives, does the minister plan to assist these organisations which provide essential services in Newman? And if no, why not? Of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, the Department of Communities continues to engage with uh, Mr. Devon Quimera, CEO of the uh, Aboriginal Males Healing Centre, 
on a range of matters, including requests for assistance and funding. Two, in 2019-20, the Department of Communities provided $44,791,837 in government funding focused on the prevention of family and domestic violence as follows. Uh, family domestic violence services, $39,735,195. Uh, family domestic violence grants, $5,056,642. Uh, in 2020-2021, the Department of Communities will provide $46,885,579 in government funding focused on the prevention of family and domestic violence as follows. FDV services, $40,497,003. FDV grants, uh, $6,388,576,000. Uh, three, the McGowan government is committed to addressing family and domestic violence through the path to safety, Western Australia's strategy to reduce family and domestic violence 2020-2030. The Department of Communities has partnered with various Aboriginal community controlled organisations, ACOs, to build their capacity as effective organisations throughout Western Australia. Communities engages with Aboriginal people, families and communities to support access to culturally informed and Aboriginal-led service responses and culturally secure mainstream service delivery. The CEO of the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre is a current member of the Department of Communities Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisations Strategy Project Working Group. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Agriculture. I refer to a question without notice 1171 and the Minister's response to part five of that question, and I ask one, given the level of community objection demonstrated through petition 160 by a security levy imposed on residents of Boyup Brook, tabled in the Legislative Council, the low rate of response from the Boyup Brook Shire area of 1.2 per cent of landowners, and that 83 per cent of respondents oppose the levy, can the Minister outline how the requirement to demonstrate community support has been met in respect of the levy imposed on landowners in the Boyup Brook Shire? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, look, I thank the member for the question. I, I acknowledge that uh, the uh, uh, the Shire, the uh, uh, Boya Brook Shire, has been uh, running a war of attrition uh, against the Blackwood Biosecurity Incorporated, and I, and I really think what they have been doing is is quite disgraceful. Uh, certainly, when the times that we've written out uh, to those uh, those um, uh, the landowners in the, uh, the Boy Up uh, Brookshire. We have very low uh, response rates. Um, and indeed, this year, when we did the general advertisements in the local papers, we had a total of, uh, of two responses. Uh, and we are aware that the Shire has been actively going out there um, uh, 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 urging people um, not, to, uh, not to pay their rate, refusing to provide the rating detail, uh, and indeed causing a situation where the leadership of this group, which are incredibly dedicated individuals, volunteers, are really coming to the end of their tether. And the fantastic work that has been done, and this, uh, the BBI was set up uh, under the previous government, and it, it has been, uh, it has done some extraordinary work. If you just look at the projects, that it's been uh, that it has been uh, running uh, and and the success uh, in the last two years um, they have removed uh, uh, 1,500 foxes. They've had their very successful fox hunts and have been able to get rid of uh, 1,500 foxes in the last 18 months. Uh, they have removed 530 feral pigs. So yeah, we'll certainly be um, uh, considering this and trying to engage uh, and seeking to engage with the uh, community. We're not seeing any of this come out from the correspondence and the advertisements that we're having, but we do acknowledge that the Shire President and the former Shire President, who's been putting his, his uh, petitions in the Mitre 10 uh, and wording everyone up uh, to sign it, is, uh, is having uh, what no doubt is his uh, desired impact, which is to destroy this, um, what has been since 2014, a very, very successful organisation. So we will certainly um, be considering the petition. Honourable Charles Smith. 
My question without notice of which some notice has been given is directed to the Minister for Education. I refer to the West Australian curriculum and ask one. Can the Minister name anything in the school curriculum that is designed to foster among students a healthy sense of respectful pride in Australia and the country's achievements? Two, can the Minister provide detail on any part of the curriculum designed to help students develop an understanding and appreciation of our country's Western civilisational heritage? Leader of the House. Thanks, Honourable Member. Uh, I thank you for some a notice of the question. One to two, the WA Curriculum and Assessment Outline sets out the following values which underpin the curriculum and what students should value as a result of their learning at school. Respect and concern for others and their rights, pursuit of knowledge and commitment to the achievement of potential, self-acceptance and, self and respect of self, social and civic responsibility and environmental responsibility. Further, the teaching of history uh, and civics and citizenship to enable students to develop a lifelong sense of belonging to and engagement with civil life, civic life as an active and informed citizen in the context of Australia as a secular multicultural nation, knowledge of the values, principles, institutions and practices of Australia's system of democratic government and law and the role of the citizen in Australian government and society, and a knowledge, understanding and appreciation of the past and the forces that shape society. Further, Year 11 and 12 Politics and Law Studies uh, course develops students' knowledge of the principles, structures, institution and processes of political and legal systems, primarily in Australia. The Honourable Colin Ticknell. Mr President, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, uh, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Transport, regarding delays in regional transport services. Um, in this year's annual report, I observed that not one of the four regional train services met their on-time running KPI, with the prospect of missing its uh, OTR of 80 per cent by 70, 20 per cent, 7, 27 per cent, giving it a score of 53 per cent. In the annual report, delays were attributed to signalling issues and track works managed by a third party. I asked, one, can you elaborate on what is meant by track work issues? Two, uh, who are the third party contractors? Three, do these contractors uh, contain any provision for damages for excessive delays? A, if so, what are they? And four, alternatively, is there any incentives to minimise disruptions? Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Madam President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to two. Uh, Western Australia's rail freight network, including the line on which the prospector operates, was privatised by the former court Liberal government and is now leased to ARC Infrastructure. ARC Infrastructure is responsible for operating and maintaining the line. Track work refers to physical maintenance work on the track, including repair and replacement of rail infrastructure overseen by ARC Infrastructure. Three, the track access agreement with ARC Infrastructure does not have penalties for late running. Four, there is a performance incentive scheme as part of the track access agreement. President, my question about notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Corrective Services. I refer to the answer to my question on notice 3025 and to the review of the prison's order for disruptive prisoners. And I ask one, has, the, has this review now been completed? Two, if yes to one, A, what were the findings of the review? And B, has the review recommended that the order be abolished or amended? Three, have any permanent changes now been made to the order? Four, if yes to three, what changes? And five, if no to three, why not? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Corrective Services. One no, two to five, not applicable. The Honourable Robin Chappell. Uh, Madam President, uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is directed to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I refer to the letters sent to the Department of Planning, Land and Heritage, DPLH, by Green Legal on behalf of Fortescue Metals Group, FMG, in relation to their Solomon Mining Infrastructure Project, Phase 5, and outlining FMG's refusal to follow the recommendations of the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Committee. And I ask, can the Minister confirm that the letter from Green Legal on the 22nd of April states the ACMC does not have the power under the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972 or otherwise to direct FMG or, in brackets, any landowner to complete any action. FMD, FMG does not intend to complete, uh, sorry, does not intend com uh, completing the actions. 
Is it standard practice for proponents to reject or refuse an action proposed by the ACMC in respect of consultation with traditional owners? Three, is it standard practice for the proponents to influence the decisions or actions of the ACMC? Four, if no to two, does the Minister consider this refusal to be good practice uh, generally by proponents? Five, if no to four, will the Minister intervene in his capacity as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. One, I am advised that Green Legal, on behalf of F FMG, wrote to the Registrar of Aboriginal Sites as outlined in the Honourable Member's question. Two, no. Three to five, proponents are required to provide information to the Aboriginal Cultural Material Committee, ACMC, so that it can undertake its responsibilities under Section 18.2 of the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972, which includes determining whether there are, there are any Aboriginal sites on the land, the importance and significance of any such sites, and making a recommendation to the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs as to whether or not consent should be granted and any conditions. The ACMC undertakes its functions diligently and in good faith. The Minister has previously expressed his expectations, both publicly and directly to proponents, that proponents will consult and engage respectfully and constructively with traditional owners in relation to the, to the identification, protection and management of Aboriginal cultural heritage. The Honourable Simon O'Brien. I have a question without notice to the uh, Minister for Agriculture. Uh, I refer to the Veterinary Practice Bill 2020 and I ask one, am I correct in my presumption that this legislation is so urgent it had to be introduced the day before Parliament finishes? Two, if so, after the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation reports on this bill on or about January the 9th, will, are you going to insist that Parliament be recalled to deal with the bill? And three, if not, why have you introduced it? Minister I th thank you, Member, for the question. Uh, uh, this bill uh, uh, has been kicking around since 2006. So we, if we recall, as I set out in the second reading speech, uh, that there was an agreement in 2006 that we would, uh, uh, that we would uh, move towards uh, uh, mutual recognition. And I think, as I also referenced in the second reading speech, in 1995, we made uh, we entered into an agreement to uh, uh, change the rules in relation to the ownership of vet practices. Now, uh, this, of course, this of course has has uh, has uh, has uh, taken some time. Obviously, I think uh, your mob were in there for about eight and a half years. Uh, not a lot of progress was made. Uh, we we did come into uh, in, when I came into uh, into uh, government. Uh, it was put up to me, the, a version of the bill that was put up to me. Um, unfortunately, uh, that version of the bill uh, was not terribly competent, it uh, turned out. Uh, we did have, um, and I would love to have an opportunity to talk about it one day, but some very deep, profound problems within the legal department of the old Department of Agriculture at that time, which we did eventually sort out. Uh, anyhow, after uh, getting uh, a new and very professional uh, legal team onto the case and doing detailed work, we've done it and we've got it. So I wanted to make sure, after from 2006 to now, now that we actually got a bill, I was going to get it in before the House, and hopefully, hopefully, when we come back after the next election. Uh, this piece of legislation will be ready to go. You would have had ample time to review it, and I look forward to your fulsome support. The Honourable Colin Holt. President, order. The Honourable Colin Holt. Member. Member The Honourable Colin Holt. Thanks, Madam President. My question, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. Has the Government, the Attorney General or Police Commissioner, received an ex gratia payment request from retired Police Officer Laurie Morley? Um, if so, what is the status of the request? When can Mr Morley expect an answer from the Government? And C, given Mr Morley 
lodged the request over 18 months ago, does the Minister consider this is an appropriate time for Mr Morley to wait for an answer to his request? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australia Police Force advises the submission has been received on behalf of Mr Morley, and the State Solicitor's Office is providing advice on this matter. Mr Morley will receive a response as soon as possible after that advice has been received and considered by government. Importantly, medically retired police officers can access funding for medical expenses for a work-related injury or illness through the former police officers' medical benefits scheme. The McGowan government has supported and recognised medically retired police officers through the $16.1 million redress scheme, which provided payments of up to $150,000 to former police officers medically retired due to a work-related illness or injury and reforms to the Police Act 1982 to create a new standalone scheme to medically retire injured or ill police officers, which is completely separate from the completely inappropriate Section 8. Building on these initiatives, the Government has also committed to implement a police compensation scheme for officers who can no longer serve due to a work-related injury or illness. The Hon. Robin Scott. My question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment, representing the Minister for Police. I refer to an article published today by Erin Park of the ABC Kimberley, the headline of which reads, Broom Car Theft Spree Leaves a Trail of Torched Vehicles with Residents, Tourists Demanding Action. This article comes after 40 cars have been stolen in 30 days. I also refer to my question C1323, which asked whether the Minister intended on meeting Broome residents and to which I got a poor response. I again ask, one, can the Minister confirm whether or not she is arranging to meet the Shire and the residents of the town to address the issue? Two, if no to question one, why not? Three, if yes to question one, when will this meeting be held? And four, does the McGowan Government have any plans to change its failing policy to address antisocial behaviour in regional towns? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been prov provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to four. The Western Australia Police Force advise senior police will attend the meeting. Organised by the Shire and Broome Police continue to target crime hotspots, respond to any reports of suspicious behaviour or crime. This explicitly includes stealing of motor vehicles as a priority offence. Measures are in place to target suspected offenders and offending, which includes the rollout of new technology. Youth crime issues remain a priority for Broome Police, and every opportunity is taken to break the cycle of crime committed by young persons, including in partnership with other agencies. Under the McGowan Government, there are 120 more officers in, in regional <coughs> WA compared to the previous Liberal National Government. The McGowan Government has also committed and put funding on budget to recruit an additional 800 police officers. 98 of the first 200 of these officers will be deployed to regional WA. The latest crime, police crime statistics published on the WA Police Force website show crime in regional WA was down 30.2 per cent on the same quarter last year. The Hon. Tim Clifford. President, my question, with, uh, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Commerce. I refer to Rewards expected, uh, expects 20 per cent Perth rental increase from March when COVID-19 emergency ban ends from the West Australian on November 2, 2020. And I ask one, will the Minister confirm that the moratorium on evictions and rent rises will not be extended, will not be extended beyond March 2021? And two, given the record low vacancy rate and projected rental hike of 20 per cent come March, what will the McGowan government do to secure immediate housing options to, to be delivered this financial year for those who have been priced out of the market? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the uh, member for the question. The following information has um, been provided by the Minister for Commerce. One, the Minister for Commerce noticed in, uh, noted in his appearance in the Legislative Assembly Estimates Committee hearings on 22nd October 2020 that the emergency period will not be extended unless there is a calamitous second wave that absolutely disrupts the WA economy. Two, the McGowan government provides a, provides a range of policy responses to address movements in the broader housing market. These include the investments in social and affordable housing made through the $394 million Metronet Social and Affordable Housing Package, the $151 million Housing and Homelessness Investment Package, and the 319 million social housing economic recovery package. 
In addition to these investments, the Department of Community provides a range of services, including rental assistance and bond loans to those in housing needs and who may not specifically require a publicly owned house. The Honourable Ken Baston. That notice, with some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing. One, what is the breakdown of cost of the $17,175 average operating cost per public rental property? Two, does the $17,175 include or exclude rental income from the property? And three, why is the actual cost so much higher than target cost for 2019-20? Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of this question. Uh, uh, in one, uh, in 2019-20, the actual component costs for uh, of efficiency key performance indicator 1.1, uh, average operating cost per public rental property, were the following. Madam President, uh, the answer is in tabular form. It lists the component cost of service and the year spend actual. So I ask, uh, I seek leave to incorporate that into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted, the Minister. Thank you. It should be noted that some cost component costs above, <laughs> such as construction and associated administration costs that are capitalised, are excluded from the calculation of the KPI. Two, rental income is excluded. Three, the actual spend of 17,175 exceeded the target of 14,550 for efficiency key performance indicator 1.1 due to increased maintenance expenditure and an increase in the expected rate of default for payment of rent from customers as a result of the effects of COVID-19. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to Legislative Council question on Notice 1075 answered on 9 May 2018, and specific, specifically local projects, local jobs grants awarded in Geraldton and the Midwest. I ask one, please identify the projects that were funded in the region and the funding amount. Two, please advise if any of the projects changed in scope between the funding commitment being made and the grant agreement, and if so, detail the change. Three, have all, the, all of the granted funds been acquitted, and if not, please detail. And four, given Geraldton was the only place in my electorate that was granted local projects, local jobs funding, can you please advise how other communities in other locations can access funding under your scheme? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I, th I thank the member um, for, the, uh, for the question. Um, one to two, I tabled the attached information identifying the list of projects that were funded in the City of Greater Geraldton, the funding amounts and the project uh, which has been varied. Three, uh, out of 34 projects in, in total that were funded, 26 have been acquitted to date. Two have been completed and are under assessment, and six projects remain in progress. Uh, four, this is not an ongoing program. It was an election commitment for Term 1. That document is tabled. The Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Environment. I refer to the site management plan for the decommissioned Dalyellup Waste Residue Disposal Facility, tabled paper number 4615, and I ask, one, has the Department of Water and Environment Regulations received annual environmental reports for 2018, 2019, 2020 as required by the plan? Two, if no to one, when is it, is it expected to receive them? Three, if yes to one, Will the minister please table a copy of each, electronic only is preferred, mm -hmm. and four, will the minister please table a copy of Tronix's final closure plan for the Delia Waste Residue Disposal Facility, version three, July 2018, and if so, why not? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President. Uh, I thank the honourable member for some notes the question. I note in the question that was lodged, uh, you say electronic only is fine, not electronic only is preferred, so th there is that uh, difference. Uh, one, the Department of Water and Environment Regulation DWA, has received the 2019 and 2018 annual uh, environmental reports. Two, the 2020 annual environmental report has not been received, as it is not due to be submitted to DWA until June 2021. Three, I table the 2019 and 2018 annual environmental reports. Four, DWA has advised that Tronox is currently updating the final closure plan for the Dalyellup Waste Residue Disposal Facility as a result of a review from the department. Uh, I table version three of the plan, which is currently being finalised, currently being revised. Those documents are tabled. The Honourable Yorn Sibber. 
I'm just waiting for my question to come back up. There we go. Um, my question, without notice of which some notice has been provided, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Planning. And I refer to the City of Joondalup Draft Scheme Amendment Number no. Five, and I ask one: When did the Statutory Planning Committee of the WAPC consider the scheme amendment, and what was their decision? Two: When did the WAPC pro provide you with a brief regarding the scheme amendment, and what is their recommendation? Three: What is the nature of the WAPC's engagement with the City of Joondalup with respect to finalising the scheme amendment? And four: When does the Minister expect to approve the scheme amendment? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some answer to the question. One to four. The statutory planning committee considered the amendment on the 27th of October 2020 and resolved to provide a recommendation to the Minister for Planning. The SPC recommendation was informed by engagement between officers of the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage and the City of Joondalup. Recommendations in relation to local planning scheme amendments have always been treated confidentially by every government to avoid decisions of the Minister for Planning being pre-empted or unduly influenced. Once the Minister has made a final decision on this amendment, the Minister will release information on that decision. Leader of the Opposition. Without notice what some is given is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to your response to question without notice number 158 asked on October 22, 2020, and I ask one. Did the Board of Lottery West Access receive any legal advice before rejecting the grant proposal by the Margaret Court Community Outreach operating through Victory Life Services? Leader of the House. Uh, 1340. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one no. Madam President, I ask the business of the House be resumed. Business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers? The Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I'd like to provide an answer to the Honourable Michael Mission's question without notice. 1308. Asked yesterday, and I seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Oh, thanks, ma'am. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Leave is not granted. You will need to read that answer in. One. Lottery West has an overarching risk assessment framework based on uh, ISO 31000-2018. This framework is applied, uh, applied whereby the impact likelihood and Lottery West's tolerance of the risk is considered. For grants, the risk assessment criteria includes eligibility of organisation and purpose of grant, proposed evaluation of approved purpose, project complexity, budget and timeframe, project planning, organisation's capacity to deliver, grants history if applicable, known external factors that may challenge the delivery of the approved purpose, the use of the funds requested, charitable purpose, conflicts of interest, grant purpose results in negative impact for Lottery West reputation, conduct of grant customer results in negative impact for Lottery West reputation. Three, the issue of harm is not a specific criteria, however it is considered in the context of impact. Four, yes, risk assessments for all applications are saved in the grant management system. And Madam President, Leader of the House, I table the documents in relation to questions. Question on notice numbers three three four eight, asked by the Honourable Nick Goran, and three three five zero, asked by the Honourable Aaron Stonehouse. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers, the Minister for the Environment? Madam President, I table documents in relation to question on notice number three four zero three, asked by the Honourable Diane Everest. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers from any Minister or Parliamentary Secretary? If not, members, we return to order of the day number 12, births, deaths and marriages, registration amendment, change of name bill 2018, and a return to committee. Um, members, we return to the consideration of birth, deaths and marriages registration amendment change of name bill 2018 and we are, the question before the chair is at clause 8, do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Can I get indication of further clauses before 13? 10. The question is therefore that clause 9 do stand as printed. All those of that opinion who say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is clause 10 do stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Graham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Uh, Minister, 
With respect to clause 10 of the bill, uh, you will note that uh, in it, in particular, at uh, proposed section 34, subsection 1G, there is reference to an age thresh threshold for a child, and that age threshold is 12. Now, you did indicate in answer to an earlier question that uh, that is consistent with the existing statutory regime. Um, nevertheless, the government has determined to maintain that existing level. What's the basis for determining the age of 12 as the appropriate threshold level for consent to be given by a child for a change of name application? Minister. Um, so, thanks, Chair. So, we're, um, I'm advised that we're just mirroring, mirroring the existing legislation. I can't go back to the motivation behind the original um, policy decision because this is just a, a straight transition from the existing arrangement. So, I'm sorry, don't have advice at the table about what it was originally um, uh, that uh, led to that age being set. The Honourable Nick Garana. <coughs> Uh, Minister, is there um, any, as you say, this is uh, merely a continuation of the existing regime. Uh, what then are the safeguards that are in place currently that will be maintained under this new regime that will ensure that a child of the age of 12 is giving informed consent? Minister. So I'm um, advised the current practice, um, and it's proposed that this will continue, is that the uh, child needs to sign part of the form that needs to be witnessed by somebody who the registrar can satisfy themselves is uh, knows the child and is well known to the child. The Honourable Nick Garan. And this uh, witnessing protocol, uh, Minister, is it uh, contained in a written document that could be tabled? Um, you can probably get your copy of the form, but if you want a copy of the policy, uh, there isn't one, but I can get you a copy of the form. Um, perhaps we can get you a copy of the form. I guess, Minister, when you say that uh, the safeguard is that the registrar requires that the document be witnessed by someone who knows the child, uh, that in itself is a policy, albeit it might not be a written policy, um, and it then leads itself to the question as to well, what criteria is used to determine whether the person knows the child. Is it knows the child for a, a period of time, for example? Are there any factors that the <coughs> registrar takes into account? Um, perhaps if you could indicate that uh, on the record. And uh, also, I think it would be useful to uh, table this form. Minister. I can't table that the children's form. I've only got a copy of the adult form, but I'll give you an undertaking that I can provide it to you subsequently. Uh, and the first part of your question is what steps might the registrar take to satisfy themselves that the person who says they know the child knows the child?
So I'm advised that the registrar would uh, speak to the child and the person um, involved to satisfy themselves um, of the knowledge that the adult has of the child and that the child understands what they're signing. Gentleman to go. And Minister, um, uh, how often is it the case that a, a child um, as young as the age of 12 uh, applies to have their name changed? Minister. Honourable Member, it's a good question. I asked it myself, but I don't have that data. The Honourable Member. And, uh, Minister, I appreciate you don't have the data readily available to you, but is it, is it data that is collected by the uh, registry? And in particular, I'm interested to know um, if they keep it, for example, for the age of 12, a separate data set for the age of 13 and so forth for each of the uh, calendar years. Minister. Yeah. Um, thank you, so Chair. So I'm advised that no, they don't keep it separately um, marked, if you like. They can, I'm advised they could, if they, if they needed to, they can actually extract that from their existing database, but they don't record it separately. So, Minister, for example, if the Commissioner for Children and Young People was to conduct an inquiry into uh, this area and to uh, satisfy himself that the uh, regime was uh, satisfactory, particularly with respect to the issue of informed consent, making sure that there were sufficient protocols in place to ensure that the child is signing in a voluntary capacity. Um, and to obtain data with respect to each of the age groups uh, from 12 to 17, uh, that data could be provided by the registry to the Commissioner for Children and Young People in such an inquiry. Minister. Um, that is a bit of a hypothetical, but I'm advised it is possible to extract that data uh, and, and, and to be able to identify the different year groups, because they would do it by date of birth. And Minister, is there in any intention uh, by the government uh, to seek the feedback of the Commissioner for Children and Young People with respect to this issue? Minister. I'm advised no. I mean, I guess I'll make the point that children, the Commissioner for Children and Young People is, um, well, each of the office bearers. I'd have to say, are um, not shy about asking uh, for things when, when they've needed them, uh, but there is no intention to specifically go uh, and, uh, and consult. Members, the questions clause 10 do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Indication of clauses before 13. The question is therefore that clauses 11 and 12 do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. That takes us to clause 13. The question is clause 13. Do you stand as printed, Minister? Uh, thank you, Chair. So there are a number of um, one, two, three, four, the remaining four amendments on the supplementary notice paper in, on my, in my name uh, relate to clause 13. These are, as I have described before, consequential um, to match uh, the uh, uh, alignment uh, with the uh, High Risk Serious Offenders Act 2020. So I move it. Um, Minister, would you like to, in moving um, the amendment, seek the leave to move yes. the four amendments on block? I would like to seek that leave. Very good. Um, members, the Minister seeks leave to move the four amendments standing in her name at 5 oblique 13, 6 oblique 13, 7 oblique 13, and 8 oblique 13 on block. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Um, members, the question is therefore that the words to be deleted be deleted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the words to be inserted be inserted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is clause 13 as amended be agreed. The Honourable Nick Garan. Now, Minister, you have quite, the government has quite rightly. Uh, amended, sought to have amended clause 13 to take into account the passing of the High Risk Serious Offenders Act of 2020. 
and in particular dealing with this this section, which uh, well one of the sections, which is section 36, capital A, dealing with the definition of a restricted person. Now, um, which is found at page 11 of the bill. Particularly because a restricted person in the bill as it was sent to the Committee of the Whole House listed six categories of person who would meet the definition of restricted person. And the first of those six categories was a dangerous sex sexual offender. And it now reads a high risk serious offender. And this amendment has also been made at line 21 on page 11 that being in addition to the amendment that's been made at line 10. But furthermore, the amendment has been made with respect to uh, lines 23 and 24, also found on page 11, and quite appropriately so, because of the impact on the definition of the term supervising uh, authority. Now, Minister, I note then that there has also been uh, an amendment made at page 14, 14, and at page 14 we are dealing with proposed section 36, capital A, which is looking at an aspect of the legislation dealing with the approval by a supervisory authority. Now, Minister, I note that at proposed section 36, capital E, subsection 5, it states that a supervisory authority must not approve the making of a change of name application if the authority is satisfied that the change of name is reasonably likely, and then goes on to set out a number of scenarios. And the third group of scenarios it reads, to frustrate the administration of any of the following acts. And there are five, there are five acts that are referred to there. Uh, can you provide any guidance to the House uh, Minister as to why those five acts were selected from the statutes of Western Australia and all other acts were omitted? Are we confident that there is not a situation where a person might use a change of name to frustrate the administration of any of the other acts in Western Australia? Chair, so, um, honourable member, there are kind of three. Um, uh, Nets here, which capture yes. those. A and B, and then C captures and lists those acts under which a supervision order can be granted. So that's why those particular acts um, have been chosen. Gentleman Grant. Okay, and um, Minister, you'll see that in the second, I think you used the phrase net, um, we have a situation there where a supervisory authority must not approve the making of a change of name application if the authority is satisfied that the change of name is reasonably likely to be regarded as offensive 
by a victim of crime or a significant sector of the community. Now, I just want to take you to each of those elements because the first is to be regarded as offensive by a victim of crime. Uh, is that intended to be interpreted such that if any victim of crime uh, draws to the attention of a supervisory authority that they are offended, uh, that the change of name application uh, cannot be made? Um, Lim, if you like, of B. Uh, it's in respect to victims of the particular person making the application. So um, I personally can't think of an example, honourable member, but I'm advised that if there were some particular um, elements of the crime or the, the person making the application wanted to change their name to the name of the person who had been their victim, mm. that's why that is uh, spelled out there. So it's not any victim. That's the victim of the person making the application. Right. So, to be clear here, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Deputy Chairman, through you to the to the minister, um, how it actually should be interpreted is at proposed section 36, capital E, 5B. Notwithstanding the words in the bill it should be interpreted as reading to be regarded as offensive by the victim of crime of the applicant. Minister. So I'm advised that's how we interpret it, that's how we apply it. You could. So we wouldn't entertain an, uh, an amendment because there might be circumstances where, in fact, you do want to take the broader uh, um, application. You're on the ground. Yes, um, and, and uh, I agree with you, uh, Minister, and I certainly don't want to propose a, an amendment. I just want to make sure that we're clear as to what we're agreeing to. Uh, the second uh, limb in proposed section 36, capital E, 5B, talks about matters that might be regarded as offensive by a significant sector of the community. That is quite vague, quite broad. Um, is that something that is uh, currently being taken into account under the existing regime? And this is, again, simply enshrining the, the existing elements? Minister. Chair, thank you. So I'm advised, um, and this is how it's interpreted now and how it's intended to be interpreted. So it might be um, that uh, the person wants to change their name to sex offender. It might be that the person wants to change their name that is, to something that is particularly offensive, um, for example, um, to a particular multicultural group um, in, in the community. Um, it's broad enough um, to capture uh, that, but that's, I'm, under, I un, I'm advised that's how it is applied now. Members, the question is clause 13 as amended be agreed. The Honourable Th Grant. Th thank you. Um, and Minister, again, um, is there any uh, uh, written policy guidelines as to how this th – there's a lot of discretion that we've been discussing over the course of today. Is there any policy documents, any written guidelines at all with regard to these discretionary items?
Minister. Okay. Uh, so, Chair, uh, I'm advised there is a policy, uh, a written policy. I asked if I could table that now, and I can't. They don't, they don't have it here. Uh, I, I'm advised that it is uh, identical or similar to uh, the policy that applies in uh, other jurisdictions around Australia. If the honourable member was interested in it, I'm advised there would be no difficulty in me providing it to you, but I can't do it now. And, uh, Minister, this uh, document, uh, which um, might be able to be tabled on, on another occasion, is it currently already publicly available, for example, on the, on the registry's website? Minister. Chair, thank you. So I'm advised, no, it's an internal document. So under the current legislation, there's a provision, a uh, prohibited, prohibited name, and there's a policy around how they apply that. It includes the things that are set out uh, in the clause in the bill that's before us now. And, that, and it's that document that I could table at a, a later date. I ask you to, 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 to table that, uh, Minister, uh, but bef before I do, is it the case that uh, this type of information, these type of examples that you've referred to, a lot of this information that might be in this document that uh, you're referring to, would be in the application form, as in a set of notes guiding people when filling out an application to say, look, these are the things you need to do, these are the things that you shouldn't do, these are the things you need to take into account? Minister. Learn something new every day. Um, the artist, uh, formerly known as Prince, could not have registered that squiggly thing uh, because, under the current form, um, you are ineligible or your name is considered to be a prohibited name that is obscene or off offensive, too long, includes symbols without phonetic significance, cannot be established by repute or usage or is considered to be against the public interest. That's on the form now. Mm. So, um, Minister, I would uh, ask you to um, indicate to the House when you might be in a position to table uh, that uh, policy guideline document that uh, you referred to earlier. Um, thanks, Chair. So I'll endeavour to do it as soon as possible. If I can't do it tomorrow, uh, I'll get it to you behind the Chair. Members, Quish, the honourable to grow. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chairman. Now, Minister, just turning to uh, proposed uh, section 36, capital G, you'll see there under uh, subsection 2 that there is reference to any other information that may, might, may be used to identify the person. Uh, what is intended to be captured by that subsection? Thank you. 
Minister. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. So it could be anything. It will depend on the <coughs> circumstances. But the example that I've been given is it's not unusual for someone uh, travelling internationally to have uh, limited identifying information, but uh, the travel authorities will issue what is referred to as a DIFTA, um, which is... Yeah, which is the um, sort of approval to travel uh, authorisation, which is not a passport. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not something uh, else that, that identifies the person, and they may request that. It will depend on what is available in A and B and C. The honourable Grant. And uh, Minister, this business of uh, restricted persons applying to have their name changed uh, via the supervisory authority. Is that uh, consistent with the existing regime or is this a new mechanism that we are introducing here? So, Chair, thanks, Chair. So I'm advised that it is new apart from the Community Offender Community Protection Offender Reporting Act. So it's new, other than for the purposes of that other uh, statute. The Honourable Grant. Minister, is there any significance in the fact that that act that you've just referred to um, is not found anywhere in Division 3? Sorry, Minister, just uh, to correct that, I see at page 11 on line 16 through to 19 that there is a note to the definition of a restricted person. And there it says the Community Protection Offender Reporting Act 2004 Part 4A is relevant to changing the name of a person who is a reportable offender. Um, now, I take it, even though that's not abundantly clear from those form of words, that there is a mechanism currently in place which allows certain people captured by the Community Protection Offender Reporting Act of 2004 to change their name. Now, my, my question, Minister, is a, a little like the earlier one with respect to children changing their name at the age of 12. Um, how common is it for a person captured by the Community Protection Offender Reporting Act of 2004 to apply to have their name changed? Minister. I'm told it's very rare. The mechanism that you were, you were assuming was in place is the police commissioner. Um, so they need to apply to the police commissioner. Um, I'm told, uh, and, there, and from there, it's very rare. Well, I can't give you any data. That's a question that would need to be addressed uh, to the police commissioner. Gentleman Grant. My final question with respect to clause 13 of the bill is looking at uh, proposed section 36 capital H which deals with the issue of delegation. Are we adding an extra power of delegation uh, here by the chief executive officers or is this maintaining an existing power of delegation? Minister. So the, the reference to restricted persons is new, so this is a new power, um, and it's anticipated that the CEO would want to delegate uh, down um, to. Oh, who's that saying? What was the officer that you were saying? Probably commissioner. Probably to the commissioner. Gentlemen, Mr. Sorry, um, Minister. Uh, you talk, you talk about the Chief Executive Officer wanting to delegate down to the uh, Commissioner. 
Uh, which commissioner are we talking about there? Let, I just want to be clear, because uh, if I look at the definition of uh, supervisory authority, it's talking about different chief executive officers in each of those occasions. Yes, sir. Delegating to the Commissioner of Corrective Services. The Honourable My Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Minister, I just have a few questions regarding the penalties that are prescribed in um, Clause 13. In particular, there's a penalty for a breach of uh, proposed Section 36 capital C and 36 capital D, and it has been set at imprisonment for two years and a fine of $12,000. I take it that uh, those are to be read in the disjunctive, that it's uh, one or the other or a combination of both as a penalty for a breach of that particular provision? Section proposed, section 36C and propose section 36D. Yeah. I take it is that that is meant to be applied as one or the other or both. Or the other. You can't Michael get a. Oh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. So you're telling us that it can't be a punishment of one year's imprisonment and a fine of, say, six thousand dollars imposed on an offender. Mr. Chair, it cannot be. You know, my commission. Um, Was uh, was any thought given to the penalties more generally in the Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Act when uh, this bill was drafted, uh, given that there seems to be a wide range of penalties and uh, also some variations in drafting practice regarding the proposed penalties compared to what are uh, uh, the practice adopted in the substantive act. Has there been a review done? Minister. I'm not sure how that helps us the, the, to consider the drafting um, uh, arrangements. I can tell you that the penalties are those that apply in the community protection uh, Offender Reporting Act of 2004, so they were just mirrored. General my commission. Okay, well, um, one of my questions is a drafting matter then. And I'll just find the uh, an apposite example. Right, uh, we, we have, for example, um, currently section 59, sorry, currently section 60 of the Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Act 1998 uh, says that uh, it's an offence if uh, you uh, tie it obtain certain information without the authority of the registrar and so forth. Penalty, $10,000 or imprisonment for two years. I take it that 
that is meant to be materially different, or is it meant to mean the same? You, from what you've described, it's the same as imprisonment for two years and a fine of twelve thousand dollars in terms of the uh, the way that the the offences, the penalties are structured. Well, why is there a I mean, the, section 60 seems to, to be quite plain. It's one or the other. Why has this particular formula been adopted for the penalties in 36C and 36D, which seems to me confusing? Yeah. Minister? I don't have a draft. I don't have parliamentary counsel at the table, so I, I don't, I'm not in a position to explain the difference. I hear what you're saying. I understand what you've pointed out, the difference, uh, but I'm not in a position to provide an answer as to why um, they were... The new form was drafted in a different way. The Honourable my Commission. But you're assuring us that, in fact, it is uh, to the same effect, one or the other. Minister. I'm advised, absolutely. The Honourable my Commission. Okay, look, I'll leave the subject. Thank you. Members, the question is clause 13 as amended be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is clause 14 do stand as printed. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is to be the title of the bill. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Members, the Minister has moved our report to the House. All those of their opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I shall report. Mr Deputy President, the Committee of the Whole has considered the birth, Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment Change of Name Bill of 2018 and agreed to same with amendment. The Leader of the House. Uh, thank you. I move that consideration of the report of the Committee of the Whole be made an order of the day for the next sitting of the House. The question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Now, uh, the uh, order of the day number 32, the Mutual Recognition Western Australia Bill 2020. Uh, second reading adjourned. The question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Peter Collier. Thank you, Deputy President. Mr. Deputy Premier, I stand uh, on behalf of the Liberal Party to say that we will be supporting this bill. And just before I do so, Mr. Deputy President, I, of course, am Leader of the Opposition and also Lead Speaker. So do I, do I get two lots of unlimited time? Or? Yes. Okay. Chance. Pardon? Uh, I can assure you, Mr Deputy President, I will not be taking much time at all on this one. It's an eminently sensible bill and it's an extension of the mutual recognition um, agreement between um, um, Western Australia and the other jurisdictions, which was signed through an intergovernmental agreement in 1992, and to try and or establish protocols with regard to regulation um, amongst the states, which is eminently sensible, and also with regard to um, uh, developing some sort of uniformity with occupations around the, uh, around the nation. And again, um, it's eminently sensible. Now, the whole point of the Federation, or the, the, uh, of the, uh, establishing the Federation, of course, was to ensure that while we were, had one united Australia, at the same time, it did, 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 did provide an avenue for the various ju jurisdictions to have their own um, clarity and, dare I say, responsibilities. And we've seen that probably most profoundly, or more profoundly than probably anyone, has been since Federation over the last eight months uh, as a result of COVID-19. Again, there has been significant, significant um, cooperation amongst the states, but at the same time, the states have gone about it their own way. But probably, um, I think, just as an example, I'm not going to take up too much of the House's time, an example of uh, where you've got mutual recognition that does work 
uh, effectively is in the former area of uh, portfolio area of my responsibility, and that was education. And there are two areas there, most notably with regard to um, recognition of qualifications, which is important across the uh, across the nation. That's absolutely vital. And then, of course, as you be be we're becoming much more of a complex society. Um, uh, recognition of um, working with children legislation, etc., to ensure that um, you don't have that transference of perhaps some deviance from one one jurisdiction to another. Another one, and this is just a personal anecdote. When I, I remember when we um, just after I became, I think I may have mentioned this once before in the chamber. Once uh, when I became education minister in June of 2012, and as the the um, Leader of the House will know. I don't know if they still do, but we rotate the chairs of that, uh, of that uh, ministerial council meeting. I took over the very next week. I took over as chair. I took over in June sometime, and then a week later, I took over and chaired my first um, um, ministerial council meeting. And on the on the agenda for that um, meeting was to basically tick off a national curriculum. And um, I totally endorsed the national curriculum, but I had some issues with regard to our capacity to adopt and adapt. And so, good, I'm pleased to hear that. And I said, I'm not going to sign it. And I went in, I remember going into this meeting with all these veterans of the, uh, of the um, education world. That all been uh, informed beforehand, of course, but I said, look, I'm sorry, I'm just not prepared to sign this until we could have that clause within the um, national curriculum that would ensure that we could adopt and adapt. So, for want of a better explanation, like for example, the periodic table is the same in all the jurisdictions, and, and you know the uh, pi is the same in all jurisdictions, and you spell curriculum in all jurisdictions. But I just wanted to make sure that we did, while well, we had that uh, uh, in, you know enveloping, overarching themes with regard to our curriculum, we didn't totally throw the baby out with the bathwater. And for those real federal purists, which I'm, I guess, part of to a degree. Uh, wanted to make sure that, yes, our states could still have a degree of autonomy. And um, there was no opposition to that at all. Suffice to say, we went away a few months later. We came back with a refined, uh, um, refined uh, agreement. And so we now have a national curriculum, which I understand is still working quite well. Um, and we do have the capacity, though, to adopt and adapt in Western Australia to implant various aspects of the West Australian culture, history, heritage within uh, the national curriculum. So um, that's just one example. Aside from that, it's eminently sensible. In a nation like Australia or an island state, it is just imperative, it is just so logical that we do have that, that, um, that consensus of opinion, particularly with regard to things like, as the second reading speech says, particularly with regard to things like um, uh, regulations and also recognition of standards with regard to equivalent occupations in other states. Um, now, the, uh, this bill will ensure that the termination date is the 28th of February 2031, provides certainty across the nation. As I said, it's a very uncomplicated bill, it's an eminently sensible bill, and the opposition will support it. The Honourable Alison Zamon. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise as the lead speaker for the Greens to indicate that we will be supporting the passage of the Mutual Recognition Western Australia Bill um, 2020. Um, WA's uh, passed laws adopting the Commonwealth Mutual Recognition Act in 1992 three times, in 1995, 2001 and then back in 2010. And the current 2010 Adoption Act expires on the 28th of, fe of February next year, which is why uh, we are needing to debate um, this, uh, this bill urgently now. Uh, and effectively what it's going to do is continue the mutual recognition scheme uh, for another decade. So what it does is it provides for two things. Uh, for goods produced in one jurisdiction to be lawfully sold in another without having to meet um, further regulatory requirements uh, and occupations uh, that a person is registered to practise in one jurisdiction can be practised in an equivalent occupation in another jurisdiction. So. Um, uh, as a result, mutual recognition uh, removes barriers to interstate trade in goods and, in, and, um, and uh, labour and jobs mobility, or at least particularly in normal times when we don't, in the absence of hard borders. 
um, that have been imposed to protect communities from COVID-19. Um, there are some important exemptions from mutual recognition. Uh, permanent exemptions are contained in, contained in the two schedules to the Act. Uh, Schedule 1 is a list of permanently exempted goods and Schedule 2 is a list of permanently exempted laws relating to goods. Now, Section 15 of the Commonwealth Act also contains a temporary exemption process and Clause 5 of the Bill confirms that WA can use this temporary exemption process if it wants to. So the effect of exemptions, whether they're permanent or temporary, is that when those particular goods are imported into state, they still have to comply with the laws of that jurisdiction. So since WA last adopted the Commonwealth law a decade ago, there have been some further exemptions made. Uh, they relate to container deposit schemes in the Northern Territory, New South Wales, the ACT and now also WA. Uh, and they mean that containers imported into those particular jurisdictions, including ours, have to comply with their container deposit scheme. Um, so. I, I ask the minister to, pl to please confirm um, that there have been no other changes to the law since uh, 2010, um, and to the best of my knowledge, none are currently contemplated um, before um, this bill receives um, royal assent. Um, the uh, 2015 Productivity Commission report into both the Mutual Recognition Scheme and the Trans-Tasman Mutual Recognition Scheme, uh, which mu mutually recognises goods and occupations uh, between Australia and New Zealand, found that both schemes were generally working well. Uh, but the Productivity Commission did have some criticism, that there was a risk of the benefits being slowly eroded due to regulators not always implementing mutual recognition as required. And they also raised concerns about weak oversight and an increase in the number of goods and related laws permanently kept out of scope. So there were various findings from that Productiv Productivity Commission and recommendations in relation to those issues. So only two of the Productivity Commission's recommendations relate to the text of the legislation. Uh, recommendation 5.5 uh, was that the legislation be amended to clearly allow background checks to occur in the local jurisdiction if those are required to practise a particular occupation in that locality. Uh, for example, working with children checks. And uh, I do ask, um, please, to, for the Minister to confirm um, how, how that issue is being addressed. And recommendation 7.3 uh, repeated an unimplemented recommendation from the Productivity Commission's previous 2009 review report that in order to simplify the amendment process, uh, all Australian jurisdictions should refer power uh, to amend the legislation to the Commonwealth subject to a requirement that they have to approve any, further any future changes. I note that the bill before us doesn't, does not implement that recommendation and to do so would of course raise um, sovereignty issues for this parliament which holds responsibility for lawmaking in, that, in this state. Uh, but with those um, few comments uh, and, and, subject, and subject to those questions, um, and I'm sure the minister will be able to answer them fairly quickly, um, the Greens are supporting in this bill and supporting its swift passage. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. The Minister in reply. Uh, thank you very much. I thank members for their uh, fulsome support and um, extensive contribution to the debate um, of uh, this um, piece of legislation. Um, in respect to the two questions asked by the, uh, the Honourable uh, Alison Zamon, uh, I'm advised no, there have been no other changes since 2010. In respect to the example you gave around the working with children's check, um, I'm advised it would have to change at the Commonwealth level and that there is, there's no um, advice available to me that we have any information that there's any change proposed at the Commonwealth level. Uh, so that's the, the most information I'm able to give you about that. If it was a, a, a matter that the member wanted further information on, I'm sure the advisers could assist um, afterwards if there was something in particular you were um, looking for. But with those uh, comments, I commend the bill to the House. Members, we're dealing with the Mutual Recognition Western Australia Bill of 2020, and the question is the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mutual Recognition, Western Australia Bill 2020, second reading. Pardon? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, I move the bill be read a third time. Forthwith. 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 
Members, the question is the bill be read a third time forthwith. All of those other opinions say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Paul. Members, the question is the bill be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, we now move to the order of the day 21, Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill 2019. And the question is that the bill be read a second time. All those, the Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting President. Uh, the criminal law amendment uncertain dates bill 2019 is uh, to deal with a rather significant problem that uh, used to be encountered from time to time in uh, prosecutions where the date on which an offence had been committed, some offending con conduct found in the offence had been committed was uncertain, or where it was uncertain, where, uh, uh, but all, where uh, the age of a complainant to an offence may be uh, unable to be clearly determined. And this bill goes towards correcting that sort of a problem. It's uh, an important reform and, as I understand it, greatly desired by the Director of Public Prosecutions to ensure that prosecutions don't fail due to uncertainty as to either the date that the offence was committed or the age of uh, the victim of an offence, where that is a material element of, um, of the offence. The problem can arise in a variety of ways. Ordinarily, the date on which an offence has been committed is, uh, is not an element of an offence. It's, it's merely a particular. It helps identify to an accused and to the tribunal a fact that has to adjudicate on the issue at a trial as to uh, the circumstances help identify an incident. And it's not something that, as a rule, would need to be proved beyond reasonable doubt, as it is not an element. It is an identifying feature. It works in a variety of ways. It not only assists an accused to determine or to uh, have identified to the accused the particular circumstance that is the subject of the charge. It can operate to assist an accused to not be charged twice with the same offence, and it can ensure that uh, there is, uh, is clarity as to which particular circumstance, where there are quite a number of different offences, uh, is the subject of proceedings for the purposes of perhaps establishing an alibi or some other defence. The problem arises, however, that with that uncertainty there can be a jeopardising of the viability of the prosecution. Ordinarily that would not be a problem. It's not uncommon to allege that an offence has occurred on or about a particular date uh, in the month of, say, March of a particular year, if there is uncertainty as to which date in that month it occurred, or even on a date unknown between two dates. But where the problem does significantly arise is where the law may have changed at some stage over that period of time, or, as I've indicated, where the age of the victim is a material element of the offence. There are certain sexual offences, for example, that turn on whether the, the victim was under, say, the age of 13 or under the age of 16. And if it is not clear on which date the uh, offending conduct is alleged to have occurred, that may create an uncertainty that a jury or a judge is unable, incapable of deciding beyond reasonable doubt, and hence the prosecution would fail. 
Likewise, the problem of the amendment of provisions that can fall within a period. For example, if you have a child who alleges that uh, they were sexually assaulted at some time in the first half of a year, and the law has changed in some particular and created a very, very similar, almost an analogous, if not the same offence, but with some small variation, it may be impossible to decide which of those two offences the accused ought to be charged with. And once again, this particular bill goes to address that significant problem. It was highlighted in uh, a case by the uh, name of SI against the State of Western Australia, number two, 2014 WA Supreme Court Appeal, number 44, where the problem was that the date range during which the offence occurred spanned a period during which the relevant provision of the Criminal Code was repealed and replaced. And although the Act constituted an offence under both the old and the new provisions, the person could not be convicted under either provision because it could not be conclusively established which one applied at the material time. In fact, it was always a bit of a problem, the keeping up to date uh, of changes to the sexual offence laws in the Criminal Code. The first major reforms occurred in about 1986, as I recall. 85-86, with the replacement of the offence of rape, for example, with uh, sexual assault type offences framed in a more um, uh, gender neutral way. The problem with that was that there was a lot of tweaking of those and indecent assault, indecent dealing and various other sexual offences over the, uh, the, the, uh, the successive decades. And uh, in fact, when I was uh, at the DPP, I embarked on an exercise of trying to uh, set out in a spreadsheet the relevant offences and the dates of any changes so the prosecutors might be able to pick the appropriate offence at the particular time. As I recall, it went for probably about 15 A3 pages and uh, had about 10 or dozen columns of changes over the years, to some offences, not for others. And that highlights the difficulty of being, in particular circumstances, being able to choose the right offence. But this bill goes towards fixing the problem. It actually had in it uh, a genesis in, I think, about March 2016, when uh, Cabinet, under the then government, uh, um, gave approval to draft amendments to address the problem highlighted in the case of SI against Western Australia, and uh, that we now have that bill. So the bill proposes to address broadly three circumstances, one of them being where the indictable offence occurred sometime in a period during which a relevant written law was amended, so that you can, if there is a choice between two applicable laws, the one with the lower penalty that is most apt will be the one that would be appropriate to charge, and that sort of circumstance is disposed of in proposed section 10, capital L, of the, uh, of the code once it is amended. Uh, the second variation on the theme is where there are age-dependent offences. Um, once again, uh, in the circumstances I've outlined, um, it will be the, the offence carrying the, the lesser maximum statutory penalty that can be charged. And that's addressed by section 10 capital M. And uh, another one is where there's a uncertainty as to the birth date of the victim and that is somehow material to calculating the age of the victim to determine whether or not the victim falls within one offence or another. And that's being disposed of, of uh, in section 10 capital N. Uh, the bill also deals with another circumstance, and that is uh, where there is uncertainty as to the age of an accused with, a with uh, the problem of whether they ought to be tried by the Children's Court of Western Australia or an adult court, for want of a better term, and uh, the provisions that are proposed will allow the Children's Court to retain jurisdiction. 
The amendments are based, as I understand it, on Section 80 capital AF of the Crimes Act 1900 in of New South Wales. Uh, I'd be interested to know uh, in due course from the Leader of the House whether any problems have been encountered. At the course of the briefing that we had, and this was some, quite some time ago, and I'll get into the history of it in a moment, but we were advised that there were no particular problems with those provisions experienced in New South Wales. Um, however, this bill has been sitting around since it was introduced in June 2019 and was debated last in the 15th of October 2019 in the other place. It seemed to have excited quite a lot of attention because the debate went over for something uh, like a couple of hours with uh, several members of the government wanting to uh, contribute to it. But oddly enough, although this is a significant reform and uh, a very worthy one that um, the opposition supports, and uh, we were told that uh, in August last year it was identified by the leader as one of those bills that was then in the assembly but would be prioritised in the Legislative Council, it's only now that it has been brought on to debate. And fortunately it has, because I believe that we can dispose of it in fairly short form. Uh, I cannot see any uh, particular um, hazard with it, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, it can be disposed of. But it's just a pity that it has taken so long to, uh, to bring it before the House, when it could have benefited cases quite some time ago, and indeed uh, as to why it took until 2019 to develop the bill in any cases is a mystery to me. What I would be interested in is uh, whether the Minister can provide any indication as to the number of cases that could have, been, uh, could have availed themselves of the benefit of these provisions up until now, but have been disadvantaged between the time that the bill was first introduced in the other place last year and uh, us coming to deal with it now, or well, how many cases have been put on hold over the last several years by the Director of Public Prosecutions in the hope that uh, an amendment to the law would be able to rescue those prosecutions. Um, there are ethical issues with either course being taken, but I would be, curious, would be interested to know whether there has been any decision on the part of the director to, uh, to stall prosecutions, to delay them, pending obtaining further evidence that might assist with identifying the, the relevant dates in which it was convicted or, or other matters, uh, com committed or other matters. Uh, but uh, have been uh, awaiting this, uh, uh, this reform that uh, we are dealing with at the moment. Um, that, uh, Mr Deputy President, is essentially it. There may be a few questions in the course of committee of the whole House uh, regarding the operation of specific provisions, but I can say that the bill is supported by the Liberal Opposition and uh, hopefully it will uh, eliminate the problem that has been facing the DPP in a variety of manifestations over the last, well, for as long as, uh, these pro as, as, long as it's been prosecuting, I would have thought, and one that was not infrequently encountered. And uh, on that note, uh, I allow others to make their contribution in respect of the bill uh, on that indication of our support. Members, we're dealing with the Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill 2019. The question is the bill we read a second time. The Honourable Alison Zamon. Thank you, Madam President. I rise as the lead speaker uh, for the Greens on, on, um, on the Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates um, Bill 2019, and we indicate uh, we are absolutely supportive of this legislation. It's an important bill. Um, the aim of the bill is to remove an obstacle in prosecution arising from uncertainty about particular dates that may result uh, in a miscarriage of justice for victims of crime. 
Um, when prosecuting an offence, of course, we know that certain dates are important, and the date the alleged offence uh, was committed is important, and that date determines whether or not the alleged act or omission was, was in fact an offence when it was committed, and if so, what penalty applies upon um, conviction. And in, in this instance, the victim's birth date is, birth date is also important. Some offences, uh, we know, are age, are age specific. For example, the Criminal Code contains sexual offences specifically relating to victims uh, aged under 13, victims who are aged 13 to 16, and victims aged um, un under, under six, over 16. And for some other offences, the victim's age uh, can be an aggravating factor. For example, uh, the Criminal Code makes it an aggravating factor if the victim of an assault, robbery or fraud is aged 60 or over. So the accused person's birth date is also important. A person aged under 10 years isn't um, criminally responsible for any act or omission, and a person aged under 14 is not criminally responsible uh, for an act or, or omission unless it's proved that at the time they had capacity to know that they ought not to do, to do it. So there are certain sexual offences relating to um, teenage sexual activity where it's a defence if the accused was no more than three years older than the victim and believed on reasonable grounds that the victim was aged over 16. And the Children's Court has exclusive jurisdiction to deal with criminal law matters uh, where the accused was aged under 18 at the time of the offence. So it's not always easy uh, to ascertain those dates. One reason is that the victim's or offender's birth date uh, might not be registered, uh, and unregistered births is an issue in some regional and remote Aboriginal communities. And I note that in 2017-18, the Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages re registered 155 previously unregistered at births. It registered 1,573 um, previously unregistered births between 2011-12 and 2017-18. Um, similarly, the births of some migrants or refugees might not be registered, uh, or documentation proving their birth date might, might, may, might have been lost or, or even destroyed. So another reason for uncertainty of dates is that historical offences or persistent offending across a time span can be very, very difficult for the victim to accurately date, especially if the victim was a child at the time. Uh, so the second reading speech gives some hypothet hypothetical examples of child sexual abuse uh, that, do, that, do, that goes to demonstrating the difficulty and in, uh, and in the other place uh, the Attorney General gave both actual as well as hypothetical examples uh, during his second reading reply. So where a date's uncertain, it can be a barrier to criminal law proceedings being brought, or at least brought successfully, uh, against the accused. And where the uncertainty is about whether the accused was aged under 18 at the time of the alleged offence, it can result in criminal proceedings being brought in the wrong court. So they then have to be discontinued and recommenced in the correct court, and that, and that causes stress and trauma uh, for the victim and, and also uh, a whole lot of expense uh, for the taxpayer. So what this bill does um, is address the problem of uncertain dates in relation to four different situations. So the first situation is where an indictable uh, offence is committed on a date unknown uh, during a period that spans a change in the applicable law. Uh, the bill provides that so long as the alleged act or omission was an indictable offence, both before and after the change, um, albeit two different indictable offences, then the accused can still be charged and, if the case is proved, convicted and sentenced. If the two indictable offences have different penalties, then the accused can only be charged or convicted and sentenced in relation to the one that has the lower penalty. And if the two indictable offences have the same penalty, then the accused can be charged, convicted and sentenced in relation to um, either one. The second situation that the bill addresses is where a sexual offence is committed on a date unknown that's, that spans the victim's birthday. So I've, as, as I already noted, uh, the ages of 13 and 16 are significant uh, to the determination of what that charge should be. So the mechanism for dealing with this uncertainty is similar to the one I just described for indictable offences. The bill provides that so long as the alleged act or omission was a sexual offence, both before and after the victim's birthday, albeit two different sexual offences, then the accused can still be charged 
charged and if the case is proved convicted and sentenced. And if the two sexual offences have different penalties, then the accused can only be charged, convicted and sentenced in relation to the one that has the lower penalty. So if the two sexual offences have the same penalty, then the accused can be charged, convicted and sentenced in relation to either one. So the bill goes on to define um, sexual offence. Um, and it's an offence of a sexual nature under, under a number of the chapters of, um, the of the Criminal Code. So the third situation the Bill addresses is where a sexual offence is committed against a victim whose age at the time is uncertain. So again, the mechanism is similar to those that I just described, and the Bill provides that so long as the alleged act or omission was a sexual offence, whether the victim was or wasn't of a particular age at the time, um, then the accused can still be charged uh, and potentially convicted and sentenced. And if the two sexual offences have different penalties, again, the lower one will, will apply. Um, so the fourth situation the bill addresses is where it's uncertain whether the accused was aged under 18 at the time of the offence. Uh, for example, this could be because the date of the offence is uncertain or because the accused's birth hasn't been registered. And the bill provides um, that if the charge alleges that the accused might have been aged under 18 at the time of the offence, then the children's court um, has jurisdiction, even if evidence later shows that the accused had in fact reached 18 years. Member, I'm just going to interrupt the debate and noting the time, I'm going to move to member statements. Are there any member statements? A lot of member statements. I'm going to call to the Honourable Kyle McGinn first. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> I rise today, uh, as I have done over the last uh, four years, to raise an issue in regards to a multinational ripping off their subcontractors seems to be a very common theme um, that's been going on for many years um, and doesn't seem to be slowing down. So I'm raising an issue today that was brought to my attention by um, some workers in a company called Primero um, in the mining industry out in Kalgoorlie. Um, and the issue that they raised with me, and I did a bit more investigating, was regarding a contract that was fulfilled by Primero in South Australia. Now, as members would know, South Australia has quite a big energy issue um, and has been doing a lot of work um, to try and catch up on what has probably been um, a bit of a missed opportunity on their energy infrastructure. So what uh, Primero were engaged to do, the head contractor for building a power plant in um, Barker Inlet Power Station, it was the name of the project, um, was AGL. And AGL obviously was working with the South Australian Government on finding an opportunity to get more power into the grid um, and uh, fix up some of the issues in South Australia. They then subcontracted their uh, power station to a mob called Wartzilla. Um, Wartzilla. They, uh, they then engaged Primero. Um, Primero is a West Australian company, um, quite small, but um, but have uh, plenty of experience in this space of uh, constructing the power station. So in 2018, they went over to South Australia. They engaged all local um, subcontractors on the project, um, over 100 employees. And um, what happened quite quickly into the process, um, what I've been explained is in their contract, um, they were given specs and everything for what they had to build for the power plant, but there was some relaxation on if them specs changed. Um, and I don't build power stations, so bear with me, members. But there was the ability for more money to come in if there was an expansion on how much they had to do and all the specs. So that clearly, straight away, as soon as they got onto the job, things started to get a bit blown out. Um, originally, um, Wartzilla were paying the excess without a problem. Um, because it was part of their contractual uh, um, requirements, is what I'm led to believe. Now, what happened um, part way through was Wartzilla stopped paying. Now, AGL put pressure on to Primero, saying, you're building the contract, you need to continue to build the power station. Um, they got quite a fair bit of pressure from what I'm led to understand, not just from AGL, but the South Australian Government was there, was there as well. Um, so what they did was Primero doing the best they could, they continued to do the job. And they paid all their subbies across the entire job and completed the power station. 
So they paid everybody, um, which is normally it's that primero level where they're not paying their subbies, they're trying to get the money out of the head client, and it ends up affecting the workers. But this West Australian company paid all the workers. Then they went away to try and get their money out of uh, Wartzilla, and Wartzilla denied that money. It is potentially over $50 million. So it has absolutely um, hit, hit hard Primero, their business, um, and has made very stressful uh, times for employees and uh, the uh, owners of the business. Now, I reached out to Wartzilla and asked them about this, um, obviously to see um, what response I would get, and I got a very um, hesitant response on the phone, followed by a very short, sharp official letter from someone higher up um, saying there's court processes in place and uh, we're not going to comment on it and uh, we're moving forward. Now, Wartzilla, I'm led to believe, are just starting to break into WA. Um, Wartzilla have been around for centuries. They're a Norwegian generation. Finish, finish, finish. Sorry, finish. Sorry, finish. I was getting there, member. But uh, I'm talking about WA. Them coming in, them coming in now to try and get contracts, particularly in the offshore oil and gas industry. That's what I've been led to believe. So, and, and they're a multinational, as you're right, right? They're a, a subsidiary of them is Wartzilla Corporation, which is the one that they went under. But it is also a Finnish company which manufactures and services power stations all over the world. So multinational, as I said from the start. So what concerns me around this is Primero is a small operator who's then been given a great contract, a great opportunity, goes in, makes the best of their contract, makes sure they build all these things in, and then what happens when you deal with a multinational who doesn't like what the outcome is? Lawyers come in and it just bogs down the smaller company. And nine times out of ten, what I've seen is normally the workers don't get paid. And that, that money is then argued between, say, Wartzilla and Primero. But they paid all their workers, which was a big, big step. And that was in South Australia as well. What my concern um, is, is that this company has now been absolutely um, restricted and constantly at battle now legally. I don't know how much they'd be paying up against a company that has absolute teams of lawyers. Um, so I want to raise this in the House because it is very concerning. There is some court cases, I believe, one in South Australia and one in Western Australia. Um, there has been um, a couple of cases that came through. At one point, Primero was actually um, awarded $15 million. Then it was a, there was an appeal, and I had a look at the appeal, and they won the appeal based upon the facts that uh, um, Primero had sent all the information they had to send to Wartzilla before the court date in a link. And there was about 50,000 pages. And it was done before the cutoff time, but, the, uh, but to open the link took an extra day, which ended up being after the cutoff time. So they ended up getting zero dollars out of that. After winning $15 million, by the way, um, so these companies look at every single angle they can to try and make sure they get out of paying um, this contract to Primero. So I think um, it's very important that we are vigilant um, moving forward. They, they, are, they are actively pursuing contracts privately and public in the public sector here in Western Australia. Um, and I hope all the best for Primero uh, in their battle. Um, if they are, and I can only take them on their word, that they uh, had their contract, they paid their workers, and now they are in an absolutely um, shocking position of being $50 million out of, out of pocket. Shame on Wartzilla for this, if this is true, um, and just be very weary here in Western Australia to all the public and private sector about Wartzilla, because this is absolutely unacceptable behaviour. The Leader of the Opposition. Make some more comments with regard to Lottery West. I'm very, very disappointed with the, uh, the path that Lottery West is taking at the moment. I've raised these issues on a number of occasions over the last six weeks, and they're justified. And in fact, things are just getting worse. I, I used to love going and delivering Lottery West grants when I was a minister, and to see Lottery West really descend into the body that it is now really, really disappoints me, and I'm sure it disappoints a lot of Western Australians. And it's occurred, quite frankly, Madam President, since uh, this government took over. When this government took over, they sacked the CEO, Paul Andrews, then they set about establishing a board that was compliant to them. We had, um, they basically napalmed the old board, 
Um, they put Susan Hunt in as the CEO, two new members in January 2018, four new members in uh, July 2018, including uh, uh, the Honourable Jim McGuinty, who was a former Attorney General from this uh, place, from the Labor Party, um, and they got a new approach. So sacked the CEO, napalmed the board, put their uh, hand-picked uh, people into, uh, into Lodger West to run it, and then they changed their attitude. And don't take my word for it, Madam President, take the word of the CEO. Uh, the, uh, Susan Hunt, who stated on the ABC radio on the 8th of October 2020. Well, as I mentioned, it's around our commitment to diversity and inclusion. So that, so that stands. It's in our grants framework. Our grants framework has been more explicit around these issues. About the last three years, we've had a very clear Lottery West grants framework with five pillars. The, uh, the, Susan Hunt, the CEO, stated that. So there has definitely been a change and shift in the attitude of Lottery West since this government has taken hold. Now, what has happened is it manifested itself, as far as I was concerned, uh, with the decision of the board to reject an application from the Margaret Court Community uh, out Outreach uh, Organisation for a freezer van to assist the literally thousands upon thousands of Western Australians who are going hungry to deliver 75 tonnes of food every single week. Now, they refused that grant purely, absolutely unambiguously because of uh, the result that Margaret Court happened to have some views on same-sex marriage. Don't take my word for it, Madam President. Take the word of the CEO, where she stated on ABC Radio again. So that's really the case. The Lottery West Board, in the decision-making around which grants they would support, felt that the grants from the Margaret Court Community Outreach Group didn't fit in with that approach because the public statements of the founder are not aligning with our strong commitment to inclusion and diversity. And the LBGTQI community uh, more broadly, where she has been very outspoken, and from feedback we get from many of our listeners, might also hear uh, people have been uh, people have been quite damaged and quite hurt, defended by that. And that really doesn't align with what Lodge West is about. I think the majority of the community values about being Western Australian. In addition to that, Madam President, uh, when I asked the Premier, it took me about eight questions to get this final answer, but I, finally he admitted. Yes, the application from Margaret Court Community Outreach was rejected. Why? According to the words of the Premier, he say, gave to this, this uh, House, the Board expressed concerns about Lottery West being associated with the public statements by the organisation's founder on gay and lesbian issues and on marriage equality. Unambiguously, that application was rejected because of Margaret Court's attitudes to, to uh, same-sex marriage. Now, I wanted to find out a little bit more. I, I, I ask, I've asked multiple questions in this place, multiple questions. I put in an FOI application and, quite frankly, the shutter came down. Weaving and twisting and turning the government tried to do to get out of this so they didn't have to ask. It took me six questions to get the Premier to admit that's exactly why Margaret Court's application was rejected. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll get Lottery West to come up to budget estimates and let's have a look through the estimates process. What an unmitigated disaster that was. That was the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen when I've been to estimates. Honest, the Honourable Ken Travers would be mortified if he saw the way that uh, estimates process took place. It was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. I, every time we had one hour for Lottery West, Every question I asked, I got the hand. Got the hand, right? And let me tell you, Madam President, let me tell you what uh, what I asked. The very first question I asked about this was the Margaret Court Foundation and that application. The Honourable Sir Ellery stated, "I'm happy to assist the committee in providing answers in respect to matters of the annual report or the budget. I'm not going to be dealing with particular individual decisions of the board. They are not captured in the budget or in the annual report. The, the specific decision that we are referring to was indeed outside the reporting period." When has that ever, ever been a, 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 a excuse for not answering questions in this place for estimates? Never, ever. The beauty about estimates in le the Legislative Council is that we've got latitude. We've got great latitude. We don't have to go to line items. We've always been allowed from the chair, regardless of the political persuasion, to ask questions of a generic nature. All of a sudden, when there's a difficult issue, when there's a difficult issue, the government wants to hide behind the, sh the, shred, of, uh, the, sh uh, the, the shred of secrecy. That's all it is. Cloak of secrecy, sorry. That's all it is. That's what you've got here. So they want to avoid answering the questions. This is an estimate, which is sacrament to this House. It's something that we've, we absolutely value. You know what then? So I'm not allowed to do it because it's outside the confines of the time, apparently. An hour later, I went into DPC right, and asked 31 questions on questions right up until, to, uh, up until the day of the sitting. No problems. You can have that. OK, who's on the jet? Who's been on the jet all year up until today? Like, no problems. I'll get you that. So they'll answer the questions on, on, from DPC that carries right across the spectrum 
But when I ask a specific question that just happens to be contentious, the Leader of the House shows yet again contempt for this House and contempt for this parliament and refuses to answer question on the, on the basis that there's no line item. Right? Oh, members, I would love, I'd love to be an audit of estimates for the last 20 years in this place and ask, see for a, a, say that that's been a, an absolute you actually have to have a guaranteed line item to answer a question. It is not the case. It has never been the case. It's, a, it's an appalling precedence that's being set by this government yet again. So anyway, so I asked a generic question then. I said, so how many, um, how many applications have been uh, uh, rejected due to the um, uh, gay marriage issue? You know, um, a very generic question. Oh, there's a whole lot of reasons, Susan, uh, Hunt, uh, Susan uh, Hunt said. There's a whole lot of reasons as to why why a members aren't um, why an application may be rejected. She said that about three or four times, as did uh, as did uh, the leader of the house. No, 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 no. In this instance, the Margaret Court Community Outreach had its application rejected specifically, unambiguously, transparently because of Margaret Court's views on same-sex marriage. I am not saying anything about her views on same-sex marriage. I'm saying that is the way Electoral Lottery West is going. Now, I also asked a question about changes that the government, uh, that the uh, Lottery, uh, that Lottery West are going to make to the purported changes to their our commitment framework. Because I've been told that such suggested changes we're going to read as a matter of policy rather than eligibility. Lottery West does not support religious organisations for their faith or spiritual activities. Grants only support the welfare and community service activities of faith-based groups, which meet the principles of equality, diversity, and inclusion in line with government print policies, practices, and anti-discrimination uh, legislation. That's the change. Right? You'll only get, your, you'll only get your, your grant if you fall in line with our views. Also, in the Lottery Western Health Way website, they're going to change it to say supported, say to change it. Uh, what we don't support, the faith-based uh, activities of religious organisations, however, the welfare and community service activities of the faith-based groups may be supported, provided that they respect the principles of equality, diversity and inclusion. And the changes to that, our commitment uh, po uh, policy, Madam President, are right throughout the policy, apparently. Now, apparently, the board stopped the changes at the moment because of the issues with regard to Victory Life. They've parked it, parked it in 2022. Can I say to Lottery West, I've asked for that document to be tabled. I bet you any money members, I'll get the hand. I bet you any money they say no. If Lottery West have the courage of their convictions, Madam President, can I say, table that document. If you are so comfortable in your skin, table that document, put it out in the community and see what the community say. Right? Now, all I'm saying is to be fair, right? just to be fair. Now, what we've got here is a classic situation, an absolutely classic situation of social engineering. Right? The Lottery West Board, Susan Hunt, took two members of Victory Life uh, Church into her office and told them specifically, you're not going to get any grants until Margaret Court is no longer leader of your organisation. That's what we've come to in this community, members. That's what we've come to. right? So can I say to the faith-based organisations out there, guys, you be afraid, you be very, very afraid, because Lottery West are after you. They're after you. They've made it quite clear in their our commitment changes to their our, our commitment um, document. That's exactly what's going to happen. So if Lottery West have courage of their convictions, can I say to them, put that document out into the community arena right now. Table it in this house. Don't. Don't hide behind uh, this, this terrible uh, shroud, a government shrouded in secrecy because I'm telling you now um, that the people won't wear it. This is a thin image of the wedge. If they're starting now on same-sex marriage advocates or the faith, you just wait till something else starts. Madam President, I am so disappointed that Lottery West is going down this path. It has become a highly politi politicised body for an absolutely magnificent organisation. It really has. It has become nothing more than a political arm of the Labor Party, and I'm extremely disappointed. The Honourable Colin Tinknell. Thank you, President. I'll make this short. Um, Madam President, I was going to make this statement yesterday, but I, under the, uh, the circumstances, um, uh, there was a lot of condolences, and it just didn't really seem appropriate. Look, um, as a member of the South West, it's been a very, very bad week for the South West and for the state of Western Australia. We had five people dying on South West roads uh, last week, um, and, and we know that um, most of those accidents could have easily been avoided. Um, 
and it seems like a, a common theme going on when some of these accidents happen, and, and that is people not concentrating. And I, I don't know whether it's uh, uh, just a part of the, the feel for the community at the moment after the pandemic we've been through, and they're finally getting out there and visiting the regions, and um, we're coming into holiday period. We know that we've got the schoolies down there, and from the report in the paper uh, this morning, a lot of problems there too, with uh, a, lot, a record number of schoolies um, asking for medical help after one night or two nights down there. We've had uh, uh, a couple of people go missing in the ocean, one body uh, being found and the other one was missing the last I heard, and then of course that shark bite up in uh, Broome, or that shark death up in Broome. So what I'm, what I'm saying, uh, Madam President, is that, um, you know, being a member of the South West, that traumatised me. I used that road, that, that massive crash with three people died was three or four k's away from my house. I used that road virtually, uh, I suppose, uh, two or three hundred times a year. And it's, um, you know, it's a tragedy to that community. It's a tragedy to those families. Most of the deaths that we have seen on the roads have been young people. As a person that's 67, and you think that people that age have now, and their families and their friends have now lost them for life. So I, I'm, I um, implore the public out there, Madam President, and everyone that takes to the roads. The South West is just as busy as uh, the metropolitan area. You need to take care. You need to be patient. You need to be, uh, be aware that there are many trucks and different vehicles using the road that aren't uh, able to stop. You know, in a hurry, if you make a wrong move, and um, you know, and if you're out in the ocean, and you're about to go out on a remote beach, make sure you really check out the conditions before you go out there. The Honourable Robin Shuffle. Uh, Madam, Madam President, I rise tonight to speak uh, in relation to a pro forma letter that has been sent out by the ABC management to a number of its staff. Uh, it states the ABC has undertaken a review of the special high cost mining allowance and has determined, determined that as the cost of housing has significantly decreased in these locations, the reason for introducing this allowance is no longer applicable. Further, due to the significant budget pressures faced by the organisation, that is the ABC, it is no longer financially sustainable for, the, for RNL to continue to pay this allowance at a time when savings are urgently needed and redundancies are occurring. The ABC is proposing to cease payments of this allowance to you. Uh, the proposal is to phase this allowance out over an extended period to enable you to adjust your personal circumstances. Well, the current annual allowance is $18,000. Uh, from August 2021, it will be $9,000. And from August 2022, it will be zero dollars. It is important to note that this seems to be based on some stats coming out of uh, a 2019 uh, report, when quite clearly there was uh, a downturn in the housing prices, especially through uh, the mining of uh, pastoral region. But as we know, uh, as the economic prospects and the costs of business, doing business in the Pilbara from regional development have identified is that the property market has improved significantly and rising purchase and rental costs are of concern, particularly in Karatha. It is also to note that a recent report done by uh, Market, um, and that's spelt M-A-R-K-Y-T, uh, a business climate scorecard done for the city of Karatha indicates that 48 per cent of the community is concerned about recruiting and retaining the right workers. Cost of living and housing is 42 per cent. Cost of flights are 42 per cent. And access to housing and affordable housing for workers, 34 per cent. Well, we have to remember that the people that this is being directed at are not those uh, uh, members of the ABC who are a short term um, graduate employees, but these are the long-term employees in uh, Broome, uh, in Karatha, Geraldton, Kalgoorlie and Esperance, many who rent privately and uh, or indeed have bought their own houses. 
it's all well and good for the ABC and their regional manager to come up with this cock and bull position uh, without having a clear understanding of what happens in the mining and pastoral region. We know that uh, with Bechtel bringing in 1,000 uh, employees into Caratha, um, uh, Vincas Ramble for the Perdiman project, bringing in 250 families, that the house prices and rentals in Caratha will, if not triple, but at least double in the foreseeable future. And this has been identified by the Shire of Caratha. Um, it's all, uh, so the issue for me is that I, I would really love other members of parliament here to write as I am to both uh, Ita Buttrose and David Anderson and saying at their next board meeting, which will occur on the 2nd of December, to rescind this draconian position. We have to remember those senior staffers that exist in these regions are the very people that provide services uh, such as uh, cyclone uh, uh, awareness, um, bushfire awareness, and actually are embedded in the community and have been for many years. Um, graduate journalists coming in on a three-month uh, secondment don't provide those services to the community. And I am aware that uh, two of my colleagues in this chamber have already uh, identified these issues, I believe, to the board. Um, but I would urge other members who represent the mining and pastoral region to also get letters to uh, Ita Buttrose and David Anderson before the 2nd of December and say this is totally unacceptable. Uh, I will table the letter that uh, is a copy of the letter uh, sent, to the, uh, sent to the staff of the ABC and I will write, read in for people who need it uh, the emails for Ita Buttrose which is buttrose, B-T-T-R-O-S-E dot Ita, I-T-A at abc.net.au and uh, David Anderson's email is anderson.david.n at abc.net.au. And I would encourage members to, especially those members from the mining and pastoral region, to ensure that we have a long-term sustainable ABC with senior journalists and staffers who can represent the interests of the community. Madam President, I seek to table the letter. Uh, members, the Honourable Robin Chapel seeks leave to table that document. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. The Honourable Michael Mission. Thank you, Madam President. So I want to say a few <laughs> words about uh, the issue of uh, the smug refusal on the part of the government and some of its ministers to provide answers. Uh, some weeks ago, we had a motion in this place regarding the Attorney General's refusal to provide full and open information and to provide uh, clear advice when it is sought. And the Honourable Peter Collier mentioned a little earlier this evening his problems with trying to get straight answers about Lottery West. I mean, one of the, one of the great tools, supposedly, of a parliamentary democracy such as ours is the ability to examine governance of agencies oh. under government, uh, government agencies uh, and to ask questions about how they operate. But that doesn't seem to be a principle that is being adhered to or even res respected, let alone adhered to, by this current government. And to this afternoon, we had another example of it. I asked the Attorney General regarding the Corruption and Crime Commission. I'll read out the, answer, uh, the question. Given that the government has chosen to leave vacant since 28 April this year the position of Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission because it could not get its way in appointing the preferred candidate. And then I asked a number of questions, and I'll get to those in a moment. But the Attorney General simply tries to avoid having to address the issues by playing games, semantic games. His response is the government has not chosen to leave this position vacant. I'll get to that in a minute. An hour that is either deliberately or uh, obtuse or uh, a display of astonishing ignorance and stupidity. The government, he says, continues to support the candidate, the Honourable John McEchnie QC, put forward by the nominating committee. 
that was chaired by the Chief Justice of Western Australia and has been blocked in its attempts to reappoint him. Well, I remind our Attorney General that there is an act of this parliament, and the nominating committee is only the first step, not the final one. He doesn't seem to understand that or refuses to acknowledge it in his desire to have his political appointment made commissioner, reappointed as commissioner, even though his birthday will it probably disqualifies him. But to say that the government has not chosen to leave the position vacant ignores the fact that the Joint Standing Committee, of which there are members of this House, as well as the other place, put forward the names of two other candidates that it considered to be suitable. McKechnie was only one, and his name was not put forward. All three were nominated by the nominating committee as eligible candidates suitable for appointment. The government, and here is the lie, the government did choose to leave the position vacant because it could have chosen any one of the other two. Could have, didn't. That's a choice. To say that the government has not chosen to leave that position vacant since April this year is false. There is no other way of putting about it. But what makes it worse is that then he avoids tackling the, the substantive questions. One of them was, to what extent has the lack of a full-time commissioner significantly disrupted or compromised operation, operational activities? Now, members will recall that in early April this year, the Premier put that proposition that, un that unless Mr McKechnie was reappointed, there would be a sub significant disruption of operational activities. Now, only a matter of weeks ago, in Assembly estimates, we had members of the C coming to, to Parliament and on their oath saying that there has been no significant disruption, telling us that it is business as usual. Having a part-time commissioner does cause a few problems, but it hasn't been the end of the commission. So, what, so of course, the Attorney-General doesn't want to answer that question. The second one was provide evidence to support those assertions, whether it did affect or did not affect, has affected or has not. Of course, he avoids answering that one too because he hasn't got any evidence. Then we get to, have you since April asked for or received any further reports from the Commission of ongoing or emerging investigations? Now, members will recall that about the 12th, I think it was, of April, he obtained from the Commission a list of what were described as ongoing and emerging investigations. Now, as I pointed out on a previous occasion, if Mr McKechnie had volunteered that confidential information as to who he was looking at and who he's planning to look at to the Attorney-General in order to support his job application, it would be scandalous. Because then he is not using that confidential information for public purposes. He's using it to promote himself. I don't think he's done that. I cannot imagine that an ex-judge and a man in that position familiar with proper ethical behaviour would do something like that. That means the Attorney-General obtained that information, asking for it, so he could decide whether or not Mr McKechnie is the guy that he needs and wants as the most powerful, unaccountable investigator in this place. And I say unaccountable because we can't get that information from him. We don't know what is motivating him. So I've asked that question. Of course, he avoids answering it. Now, my guess is that he has. I hope to be proved wrong, but why doesn't he say so? Why doesn't he say so, members? What is this Attorney General, our first law officer, hiding this time? Like he hid the fact that he leaked information before a letter from the clerk of this place in litigation leaked it to the media before it became a public document that he plays those sorts of petty, grubby, gutter-type political games, notwithstanding his position in this, in this body politic. He's setting an example, members, for the rest of the legal profession as to how to behave. That's what he is doing, and he refuses to answer questions. <coughs> he refuses to account to this parliament. He holds it in contempt.
And the last question was, of course, if so, when and for what purpose? And he avoids answering that one too. Now, I propose to ask similar questions tomorrow. We'll see if he has the courage and the honesty and the integrity to answer them forthrightly. I have my doubts. I suspect it'll be something like a, oh, I refer you to the last answer type nonsense. But what is particularly disturbing is that the Leader of the House was quite prepared, Madam President, to put that sort of a response forward and say, oh, that's your answer. I look forward to the day when members on the government benches are over here and ask a question of a minister and the minister says, oh, the sky is blue. Oh, well, what's that got to do with the question about governance? The sky is blue, there's your answer. Take it away. You know, you, you don't, may not like the answer, may not like the answer, but there's your answer. And see if they accept that sort of nonsense where you're laying the groundwork for it. Those of you who are not on the front benches, bear it in mind. Because the wheel turns and McGowan government standards can be, going, can be quoted back at you. But what is particularly disturbing about all of this to me is that I understand that today Mr McKechnie delivered a speech. I won't go into the detail of just how wrong much of it is, but it does concern me enormously. One of his complaints was that the leader, then leader of the Liberal Party did not show leadership because she did not did not get her member on the Joint Standing Committee to do what, what the government wanted. And that, Madam President, shows a fundamental misunderstanding of his role. He takes the job. He is not entitled to it. And he ought not to be reflecting on the Joint Standing Committee. What is disturbing is that he thinks as does the Attorney-General, as does the Premier, that our members who are on committees do not exercise their judgment. They are simply puppets for their leaders. Part of the problem, of course, is they've got the Honourable Alison Zamon there on that one, that committee, and she's nobody's puppet. But that is what the former Attorney-General who set the system up thinks ought to happen. He thinks it's a travesty that they aren't hand puppets for their leaders. And the public is being sold the nonsense, according to the Labor Party, that, that, that the fraud that somehow these parliamentary committees do their job exercising their independent judgment, when what the government thinks ought to happen is that they pulls their strings and they do what the government or the leader of the opposition wants. And if that is the case, Madam President, it is wrong. Uh. I was going to give it to the Honourable Robin Scott because he had sought the call earlier and I'm trying to share it around to people who normally don't get an opportunity. So I'm going to give the call to the Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you so much, Madam President. Last week I spent uh, most of the uh, time off from Parliament in my, my electorate. Most of the time was in my home base in, in Boulder, but I did manage to get out to Norseman and Laverton. And there's a lot of optimism from the people in the regions, Madam President. And I'm so happy to report that. There's lots of opportunity out there. The mining industry is doing well, and they're crying out for people to come and take the jobs. And they're trying to encourage people to relocate to Kalgoorlie in particular. All this optimism and jobs, it's all due to the people of the regions. Nothing to do with the Labour McGowan government. No, it's the resilience, the hard work, and the perseverance of the people of the bush. And they're not stupid, Madam President. They know full well that the McGowan government has done nothing to create these opportunities. The people of the regions have done this on their own back. If anything, the McGowan government has actually held up the regions. That's what I'm being told by the people. There's a lot of frustration out there at this government who seems slow to react to the uh, issues of the regions. And these, these issues in the regions are such as anti-social behaviour, alcohol abuse, Order. violence and homelessness. When I visited Norseman, Madam President, the first thing they took me to see was the uh, mines department that was closed down in 2017 by the McGowan government. It was supposed to be a temporary closure. That was more than three years ago, Madam President. They said they could not find people to fill the positions, and yet they never ever advertised you for any of these chance. people. You had your chance. Order, order, you had your order, chance. order. I can yell louder than most people if I need to. The Honourable Michael Mission, what were you doing? 
assuring the member. I appreciate that. Speech. I think we've resolved that issue. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. That mines department also recorded births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, marriages, yeah. The people are still pegging tenements around Norsman, Madam per President. Industry is slowly starting to take off, and yet the people still have to drive two hours to Kalgoorlie to deal with the government departments. The government has abandoned Norsman, just like the court sittings, which only operates once every three months. Now, if somebody has to go to court in Kalgoorlie, the police have to spend five hours taking them up and back again. There's only six police in the uh, policemen or police officers in Norsman. That's, we're taking away one third of that police force. When I went to Leverton, the big surprise I got was the parking apron there is now more than doubled. But they're, they're determined to get a bigger airport terminal. The question I asked uh, yesterday, Madam President, uh, is the state government a supporter of the proposal to upgrade the airport terminal? And also, will the government commit to supporting the terminal upgrade ahead of the 2021 state election? Silly me, Madam President. I thought I was going to get a clear answer, but once again, it was just smoke and mirrors. And while I was in, um, while I was in uh, Leverton, the lawmen were meeting. Madam you can have your turn. Order. While I was in Madam Leverton, President. Madam President, the lawmen were having a meeting on the edge of town. Now, the lawmen are finding it very difficult to the, at the moment to dish out their customary law, and they're losing very rapidly their authority amongst the young people. They need a camp, Madam President. They need somewhere to camp when they come into town. I spoke to her about a designated camp in Leverton. The Shire there have got an area designated for it. They just need some help to create it. The lawmen are not the problem. The lawmen are not the problem, Madam President. It's the groupies and the hangers-on that come into town with them. While I was there, I just noticed all the vandalism, the, uh, the graffiti all over the freshly painted walls. Members' statement has ceased and the House is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> uh,